Um, live streams on, Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Dorothy Hui, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this virtual meeting of Cornwall Council's Cabinet. Before consideration of today's business, I will outline the protocols for the meeting. Today's meeting has been live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and has also been recorded. When members are speaking, they may choose to use their video. If the Council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I'll adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issues cannot be resolved, I will halt the meeting and the remaining business will be concluded at a future date. If a member experiences a technical issue, I will adjourn for a short period to try to re-establish their connection. As I call members to speak, I will remind you to switch on your microphone. If for some reason you cannot be heard, the democratic officer will advise you. Votes will be taken by a roll call and the result announced by the Democratic Services Officer. Where a member has a declared, where a member has declared a non-registrable interest, a disclosable pecuniary interest, or an interest by virtue of any trade union membership in a matter, they must leave the virtual meeting. Their departure will be confirmed and they will be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. To confirm the procedure for today's meeting, it is that cabinet members who wish to speak on an item should indicate by using the raise your hand function. Any members not on the cabinet who wish to speak should indicate by typing X in the chat box. So before we start today's business, I'll ask the Democratic Services Officer to confirm that the all cabinet members are present. Thank you, Leader. Um, I will now call your name. Please confirm your name and electoral division. Councillor Jeff Brown. Uh, Jeff Brown, I'm the uh, representative for UT Central. Councillor Tim Dwelly. Yes, I'm Tim Dwelly, councillor for Penzance East. Thank you. Councillor Mike Ethorn Gibbons. Mike Ethorn Gibbons, representing Laddox and Clement and St. Um. Councillor Julian German. Thank you, Councillor Julian German, uh, representing the Roseland Electoral Division. Councillor Edwina Hannaford. Mm. Uh, Councillor Edwina Hannaford, representing Lou West, Lansalis and Lanteglos Division. Councillor Sally Hawken. Sally Hawken, Scott Councillor Andrew Mitchell. Good morning, Andrew Mitchell representing St Ives West. Councillor Rob Nolan. Good morning, Rob Nolan, Truro Redanick. Councillor Adam Painter. Good morning, Councillor Adam Painter representing Launceston North and North Petherwin. And finally, Councillor Rob Rochell. Good morning, Rob Rochell representing Camelford. Thank you. I can confirm um, all, all uh, committee members are present. I can also confirm that the following officers are present. We have Kate Canale, Chief Executive, Phil Mason, Strategic Director for Economic Growth and Development, Tracy Langley, Chief Operating Officer and Section 151 Officer, Helen Charlesworth May, Joint Accountable Officer for Public Health and Care, Cornwall Council and NHS Kerno, Meredith Teasdale, Strategic Director for Together for Families, Sophie Hosking, Strategic Director for Neighbourhoods, and Melanie O'Sullivan, Monitoring Officer. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Um, so, apologies for absence. Uh, we're all here, so no apologies for absence. Declarations of interest. Does anyone have a declaration of interest to make? Note in which case uh, the next item, agenda item number three, is the minutes of the meeting held on the 17th of June, pages 5 to 36 of the papers. Um, for those uh, for accuracy, uh, I'm happy to move. Any cabinet members, any comments for accuracy? Councillor Ethan Gibbons? Uh, I'm happy to second, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Ethan Gibbons. Any um, matters for accuracy, Cabinet? In which case, uh, we'll move to the vote. It's been proposed and seconded. Um, so, Democratic Services Officer, would you like to take the vote, please? 
Thank you. Um, I will now take the vote by roll call. Please confirm after I call your name whether you vote for, against or abstain. Uh, Councillor Jeff Brown. For. Councillor Tim Dwelly. For. Councillor Mike Ethan Gibbons. For. Councillor Julian German. For. Councillor Edwina Hannaford. For. Councillor Sally Hawkin. For. Councillor Andrew Mitchell. For. Councillor Rob Nolan. For. Councillor Adam Painter. For. Councillor Rob Rochel. For. Thank you, members. Um, I confirm all members have voted and the vote is unanimous, unanimously for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the next item then is agenda item number four, leaders announcements. Colleagues, these continue to be challenging times. Call councillors and staff have adapted to new working practices and their staff have devised creative ways to continuing to deliver important services that our residents rely upon. My sincere thanks to you all. As we continue the recovery process, we're now focusing on moving from a crisis response towards a new normal, living with COVID-19. As Professor Chris Whitty, the government's chief medical advisor said yesterday, we will be living with coronavirus for some time. We have created our local outbreak management plan and we will continue to do all that we can to keep residents safe. However, the council cannot be everywhere and the police have said that they will not attend reports of people not wearing masks unless there is a public order offence. From the start of this pandemic, Cornwall Council has put our residents first and we will continue to do so. Our economy is opening up and we have given extensive support to our businesses so that they can operate safely. I again plead with our residents and visitors to follow public health advice, to keep socially distanced, to wash your hands regularly and to wear masks in line with guidance. We have seen people caring for one another throughout the pandemic and this needs to continue if we're going to navigate our way through this residents and visitors alike, please be kind to one another. At a recent meeting between myself and the Secretary of State for Housing, Communities and Local Government, Robert Jenrick, he congratulated Cornwall Council on our great delivery and exemplary approach during the pandemic. He also said that he was requesting the Chancellor to make available the unspent money from business rate grants to be used for discretionary business grants. We've been asking for this consistently over the last two months. We've been approached by over three and a half thousand Cornish businesses seeking financial help to survive. This money is already in our account, but currently government will not allow us to use it. This is an issue across the country. The Local Government Association stated the government should redistribute any unspent resources from business rate grants to councils to be spent on local efforts to help further support businesses and reboot local economies as we move into the next phase of this crisis. If, all of the, if, if this money was released, we would be able to help all of our three and a half thousand businesses that have approached us. I hope that the Secretary of State and all of us that have been lobbying, including the Local Enterprise Partnership, the Chamber of Commerce and the Federation of Small Businesses, to name a few, are successful so that struggling businesses in Cornwall and across the country can be helped and jobs can be saved. Moving on to leisure centres, the majority of councils across the country do not direct deliver leisure centres. None of us have received financial support to keep these important facilities going. Whilst leisure centres, gyms and pools will be allowed to reopen from the 25th of July, GLL runs facilities in Cornwall and they will reopen in a phased way for safety reasons, prioritising those centres best suited to being COVID secure in the first instance and then gradually rolling out to others. GLL, which runs many of the leisure services in Cornwall, is a charitable social enterprise that employs around 900 people. The cost of keeping centres in hibernation for four months with no income has resulted in a total funding shortfall of around £5 million. 
They remain in negotiations with GLL and are trying to find a solution to what has become a serious financial challenge. The local government association, on behalf of councils around the country, is saying we are calling on the government to introduce emergency funding to stabilise providers in the leisure centre who are ineligible for much of the emergency funding due to their charity status but continue to incur costs while closed and are near collapse. I hope the LGA is successful in this. Our leisure centres play an important role in reducing the burden on the NHS, tackling health inequalities and are a key delivery vehicle for social prescribing. This, needs, this much needed funding will ensure that residents can have affordable leisure provision and exercise opportunities. Last Thursday night, I and the deputy leader and a panel of stakeholders from across Cornwall came together for the Cornwall We Want live stream. This will be our biggest ever listening project. About 600 residents listened and participated, giving their views and commenting on the views of others. When we conceived of this project, we hoped that this would be a live face-to-face -face event. That, of course, was not possible. I'm very grateful to those who took part online, and many more of these events will take place on different platforms and in different ways. We want to hear residents' ideas about how we can work together to address the biggest challenges facing us. We want to understand residents' hopes and aspirations because everyone has a role to play in creating the Cornwall we want for future generations. At today's Cabinet meeting, not only will we be looking at the immediate financial challenges facing us, but also how we ensure more of our elderly residents can live, within their, live with their own front door in a safe environment how we can continue to revitalise our four streets and how we can tackle climate change. All of these are issues that we're hearing clearly matter to our residents. Miraz Brass, thank you very much. So the next item is uh, agenda item number five, which is questions received from the public. Uh, we've received one question uh, from the public, um, which I'm just uh, finding, apologies, um, from uh, Miss, uh, Miss uh, Lady of Redruth. Um, I'm not going to uh, find that, perhaps um, uh, our Democratic Services Officer has got it in front of her, Miss Lady. Um, couldn't attend today, so we were going to read it out on her behalf. Louise, do you have that? Yes, I can read that out, no problem. Thank you. Uh, the question is for Councillor Hawkin, and the question from Ms Lady is, as there is minimal scientific evidence of the effects of COVID-19 on children, will the Council confirm it will not prosecute parents or support sanctions by schools for non-attendance during the pandemic to empower parents to protect their children and vulnerable family members without the threat of additional financial burdens? Thank you, Ms Lady, for your question. Councillor Hawkins to respond. Uh, thank you for your question, Ms Lady, and for the longer version, email to me. I'll also be giving a brief answer today, but can send a longer answer too. I've spoken to parents with a wide range of views, from those desperate for their child to be back at school to those very anxious about this, particularly from shielding households. I understand the challenge ahead with schools reopening after so much disruption and uncertainty. I believe it's vital that all services work together sensitively to help children make a successful return to education. In March, when the coronavirus outbreak was increasing, the government made it clear that no parent would be penalised or sanctioned for their child's non-attendance at school. Schools and settings were closed to all but a specific group of pupils, children of critical workers and vulnerable children. Now the circumstances have changed, it's important for all children to return to school and other settings to minimise as far as possible the long-term impact of the pandemic on their education, well-being and wider development. Missing out on more time in the classroom risks pupils falling further behind. Those with higher overall absence tend to achieve less well in both primary and secondary. School attendance is therefore compulsory again from the beginning of the autumn term. 
This means from September 2020, the usual rules of school attendance apply, including parents' duty to send this child to school regularly where they're of compulsory school age, schools' responsibilities to record attendance and follow up absence, and the availability of local authorities to use legal sanctions, including penalty notices and prosecution in court. Cornwall has a mix of local authorities maintained and academy schools. The local authority has responsibility for those that are maintained, whereas academies hold responsibility for the management of their schools. Cornwall Council will continue to communicate clear expectations around school attendance, supporting schools to identify pupils who are reluctant or anxious about returning to school or at risk of disengagement. Cornwall Council will support schools to develop plans for re-engaging children, especially those identified as vulnerable and or those with a history of poor attendance who have struggled to engage during the pandemic. No school or local authority wishes to take legal action and Cornwall Council will make every attempt to work with schools to resolve parent and carer concerns and engage children and young people to attend school. All attempts to improve attendance and engagement will be made before any formal action is taken. Each case of persistent absence would be considered on an individual basis and Cornwall Council will work up closely with families, schools and services to offer all available support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins, for your response. Um, so that's uh, the only public question today. So the next item is agenda item number six, ensuring financial stability for 2020, 21 and beyond. Uh, Councillor Painter, if you'd like to introduce, please. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Happy to um, uh, propose this item. So this report sets out our current estimate of the impact of COVID-19 on the Council's finances. How are we going to balance the budget this year and how we're approaching budget setting going forward to ensure we remain on a sustainable financial footing? At the time of writing, Government had made an announcement that additional money will be made available to support us with the cost of COVID, but the allocations have not been announced. I can now say that we will receive a further 4.969 million of unring fence grant, giving the total amount to be kept by Cornwall Council of 39 million 369. Further details around the reimbursement for income losses are to come and we anticipate any help with funding for council tax and business rates in future years uh, should come out later this year alongside the spending review in the autumn. However, following yet another government U-turn, we're now told that government will not do all that it takes to support local government and pick up all costs. So the council will have to pick up some of these costs. It's therefore important that the council puts in a plan to ensure it remains financially stable for this year, but also the future. This report sets out the approach to do that. The challenge the council faces this year and over the next few years is significant. But cabinet and council officers are working hard to design and implement an intervention and mitigation plans so that we can achieve this. For this year, we're expecting all directorates, with the exception of adult social care and public health, to underspend. Adult social care have already identified an overspend and they are developing an intervention plan so that they bring their budget back onto line, which will come back to cabinet in September. We're also planning on topping up the general fund reserves so that we can offset any drawdown needed to cover COVID costs. Whilst we've been really pleased to support many businesses in Cornwall with over £250 million worth of funding, we're very disappointed not to be able to support more businesses in Cornwall through the discretionary grants, as we still not, do not have permission to use the money sat in Cornwall Council's bank account to help over 3,500 struggling businesses. We hope after support from Robert Jenrick, our Secretary of State, that he can get the go ahead from Treasury before these Cornish businesses fail, which would be a tragedy. We've already started our new outcomes based budgeting, budgeting approach for 2021-22 to refocus our budgets on the things that are most important. This methodology uses activity mapping to understand exactly what the Council spends its money on and creates better informed budget managers. The outcome of this work will be a new blueprint for the future shape of the Council, delivering against a new set of outcomes which have appropriate resources allocated to delivering them. 
The blueprint for change will include a set of investments and savings that will be driven by a council-wide transformation programme which will deliver a balanced medium-term financial plan for the next four years. The council's transformation programme will be enabled by work streams linked to modernising workspaces through automation and creating multi-service hubs. We will continue the work on a corporate business support model, bringing together business support activities into one place, which will be enhanced by our activity mapping. To start this way of budgeting, Cabinet have been in a number of workshops looking at how the whole of the Council's budget is constructed. So as to think about what needs to change in order to match the Council's activities with the budget in a sustainable way. Scrutiny committees will be seeing this and having an opportunity to input throughout autumn as part of the informal consultation on the budget. I'm happy to move the recommendations, Leader. I will just uh, find my page to the next uh, so I can read those out. So recommendations are as follows. A recommendation one, that the approach set out in the report towards achieving a balanced 2020-21 budget is approved. Two, that the one million transfer from the contingency budget to the general reserve fund reserve in order to provide financial resilience into 2021-22 is approved. Three, that the one million transfer from the waste collection budget into the general fund reserve in order to provide financial resilience into 2021-22 is approved. And that four, that the budget environment of 2.464 million from Neighbourhoods Directorate to Customer and Support Services Directorate in respect to the strategy and engagement service is approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Painter and Councillor Ethan Gibbons to second. Uh, thank you, Leader. Very happy to second the recommendations. Has been said already, this year has been and will continue to be a challenging one operationally and financially for the Council because of COVID-19. The consequence is an annual forecast net expenditure for the current year 2021 of just over 660 million, which is some 27 million over budget, reflecting the net COVID pressures of some 10 million and a further 17 million for other pressures as set out on page 46 of the papers. The forecast impact of COVID-19 for 2021 and 21-22 is set out on page 43 of your papers and totals 74 million. The support grant received from government is just under 33 million, plus a recently announced unring fence sum of 5 million. This still leaves the council well short of what is needed and having to make up the shortfall from its own resources. This is disappointing and the government should do more. The 17 million of other pressures on the budget are to be mitigated in a number of ways. These are one, adult care savings of some 8 million, with details set out on page 47. Two, direct target savings of around 7 million, with details on page 56. And three, directorates underspend of some 2 million, as set out on page 48. The net effect of all the above is to leave the crucial general fund revenue reserves at year end at around 38 million, which is just above the deemed required level of 35 million to reflect potential risks. The major challenge going forward for the Council to ensure financial stability will be to meet the estimated shortfall in 21-22 of some 23 million arising from reduced Council tax and business rates yield and details of this are set out on page 43. Other difficulties affecting the Council rate to uncertainties on the government reviews and support on fair funding, business rate retention and funding of adult social care. It is disappointing the government appears to have kicked these crucial issues into the long grass. Meanwhile, in-depth work is in hand for 21-22 and beyond and further detail will be available in the autumn as part of the budget and financial forecast review. That concludes what I have to say, Leader, and I'm very happy to formally second the proposal set out on page 37. Thank you very much, Councillor Ethan Gibbons. Uh, Cabinet members, if you'd like to use the hands up function, if you'd like to come in. Uh, 
no one indicating at the moment from cabinet. No, uh, Councillor Desmond, uh, you've put an X in the box if you'd like to come first with a question. Thank you, Leader. My question concerns uh, paragraph 1.21 of the agenda and it relates to the um, uh, training for chairs and vice chairs. Uh, do you agree with the proposal to give extra budget training to chair and vice chair scrutiny committees and that included in this process are the chair and vice chair of audit? If I could remind you that um, in the first council with a conservative and independent uh, coalition all scrutiny chairs had a shadow opposition member to ensure openness and clarity over all matters concerning scrutiny. Do you agree that this should also be uh, reinstated along with the proposal I suggest of uh, the training extending to uh, the budget? Thank you, Councillor Desmond. Uh, Councillor Harris next, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I have a simple question about grants. Um, I know what you should said, said about your conversations with Mr. Jenry, but looking at paragraph 1.8 um, as written, this is very confusing. It talks about the council having to underwrite additional payments made and that this has been approved by, and I quote, lead councillors, albeit capped by the section 151 officer at 10 million pounds. So, my question today, is there an intention to pay out money under the discretionary grant scheme above that promised as of now by HMG in the hope that H HMG will meet the bill? If so, that's a huge risk. Who are the supposed lead councillors who've accepted this? And just moving on slightly, because it still comes back to the money, money left in the original grants. The original business grant, there was a vexed question of second homes as a business. Are Cabinet happy that all the grants to these have been properly paid? And the reason I ask this question is that the guidance says that properties used for personal use are not eligible. So did we, when making these grants, specifically ask people to confirm that they were not using properties for personal use. So there's two separate questions there, really. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Harris. Councillor Taylor next, please. Thank you, Leader. My question um, actually refers to the graph that you've got on page 43. Um, so I have got a couple of points that I'd like to have clarified, if I may. So um, quite interestingly, when you look at the revenue budget, um, of uh, 1.6 the very two top uh, lines i find that quite surprising because that's basically uh, 1.6 in under two weeks but my specific question is um about the estimated and subsequent loss uh, that you've got estimated at 23.2 which is obviously at the bottom and I'd like your agreement that that is obviously slightly misleading because um, this is only an estimate. We actually don't know. But I wondered, was it actually um, uh, speculatively calculated at 23.2 in view of the fact that, you know, the government are going to be having a co-payment mechanism, which is going to be covering 75% of losses beyond the 5% of planned income. It's a, it's a little bit like a business plan that used to come into me as a, a bank manager, you know, let's see how much we can put in and see how much we can get away with. So I look forward to a reply on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Um, so I'll go over to, to Councillor Painter to respond to those three questions, but just um, in terms of the estimated loss and the County Council's network, which uh, Councillor Taylor will know uh, many county councils are um, conservative led. Um, the county councils network has been working uh, together to make sure that we've got consistency in reporting. So I, I would absolutely say it's an estimate um, that is agreed across the local government family. So we're consistent um, in what we're saying um, in terms of uh, estimated loss with the rest of 
um, the local government family. Councillor Painter, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, first, turning to Councillor Desmond's um, questions, I think, um, you know, certainly uh, training for scrutiny, I think, is important. I think, um, you know, looking at uh, training for chair and vice chair of audit, well, I'm certainly happy if um, the chair and vice chair need training that they can they can get that training. I think audit clearly does a very different job to scrutiny. So, you know, I think they are very much different purposes. So the training would probably not take place together because clearly audit training is very, very different to what uh, the scrutiny will be doing with the budget. But I'm quite happily to provide more training for Councillor Harris. That's not a problem. Um, then um, I think moving on to the, the grants, then clearly the grants was difficult. We knew that we were going to struggle to um, uh, please everybody on the discretionary grants. We uh, we were absolutely um, set up to fail with only 5% of the money available. That's why we consistently from the start said to government that that would not be enough money to support Cornish businesses um, because we knew that we had by far the largest amount of business rateable properties that were eligible for the original grant. We had more than 100 million, more than the next nearest um, local authority, which was Birmingham just because of the nature of Cornwall's economy and the number of small businesses we have. Um, we knew that it was much more than any other area of the country, but that certainly proved it. Um, so uh, with the discretionary grants, we are still calling to be able to use more of that money. And um, certainly the way that um, we worked out how we were going to pay uh, the discretionary grants and working through the various bits of guidance we had from central government, um, that was looked at and certainly looked at through the leadership board and um, we consulted widely to ensure that um, everybody from the Federation of Small Businesses, the Chamber of Commerce, um, certainly the, the MPs, uh, we, we worked across a very wide uh, group of people. And then um, when it talks about senior councillors talking about how that uh, worked within the papers, then certainly it was myself, Councillor German and Councillor Dwelly, who were the ones that were um, you know, talking uh, about how we do that. But obviously the, the various um, decisions were recorded as far as you know, the official uh, decisions and how they were taken. Um, Councillor Taylor, again, um, with business rates and council tax, we were very consistent in our approach um, working with the treasurers across the country. And it was an agreed format, um, you know, working with central government about how we calculate business rate and council tax losses. You know, clearly it's difficult to predict what's going to happen in the future. You know, if we have a, a, a massive recession, which is predicted by some in the Treasury, who are quite worried that it could be, you know, uh, worse than we've had for several hundred years, then clearly, you know, Cornwall's economy is going to have a shock like the rest of the country will. So, um, you know, I, I make no apology for saying that, um, you know, we've got to prepare along with the rest of the country for how we might be affected. You know, we get um, a, a, a lot of income, almost half our income coming in from business rates and council tax. So clearly, if we have a, a large reduction, you know, even if that's only five or six, seven percent drop in collection rates, clearly that's many millions of pounds that then will come out of the Cornish economy and will not be able to spend on be spent on Cornish services, which um, obviously is a worry for all of us. Um, to be able to sustain services over the next few years. So I think um, you know, it is something that we are very worried about, but equally we're making sure that we are consistent you know, across the country so that we are comparing apples with apples, because I think otherwise, as she says, there could be um, you know, all sorts of things made up about what's happening, but we've very much taken a consistent approach along with other um, councils across the country. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Painter. And just to clarify on the second homes point, um, we, we haven't paid out any grants to second homeowners because um, they, they would be paying council tax. The premise of the first round of grants was around business rates. So um, they were people that were paying business rates. If they were as a business or a person fraudulently um, claiming to be a business, that would be a matter for HMRC. Um, so we'll move on to our next uh, three set uh, three questions. Um, Councillor Mould, please. Um, thank you, Leader, very much. Um, I hope you can hear me. My internet isn't great today. Um, mm -hmm. My question is around. My question is around GLL. Um, given that at the outset the contract was to create a zero cost leisure facility, could you just please expand on why they now require a million pounds of taxpayers' money? 
and and given that some of our leisure centres are still very sadly closed and much missed, um, could I ask, and also could I ask, um, in the original document signed between GAL and, and Cornwall Council, was there any provision for uh, loss of earnings? Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Moulden. If you could just refer me to where this is in the report. Councillor Mould. It's Appendix 2. Is it uh, the very end of Appendix 2? Sorry, Leader, I haven't got my second screen on. Okay. Well, There's uh, a reference there to... Thank sorry, you. you might have to ask some... I'm very sorry. I should have been a bit better prepared. No, no problem. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Elliot next, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Leader. Um, I, children and family scrutiny was, was clear over the last year or couple of years that um, including the evidence that came in the Ofsted report um, that the children and wellbeing budget could not be cut further without the risk of the delivery of some services. Um, are the Cabinet Member and Service Director confident that the um, uh, 0.44 million um, budget underspend or cut um, shown is manageable? Uh, in other words, do they think that uh, they can make that underspend without risking key services? Thank you, Councillor Elliot. Um, and Councillor Allenbrook, please. Good morning, Leader. Good morning, Cabinet members. Hope you can uh, hear me all right. Yeah. Um, my question is on page 47, paragraph 3.5, which is the adult social care um, savings, budget cuts, whatever you want to call them. Am I right in thinking that we are going to have an opportunity at scrutiny to look at these because I think you said that we would, but then I think you also said that these were going to come back to Cabinet in September. So can you just clarify when exactly scrutiny are going to be able to to look at those particular figures? Because given the issues for adult social care anyway, I really question whether there is any way in which those savings cuts, whatever you want to call them, could be made. But we need to look at them as a committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I was just seeing if uh, Councillor Buscom was on the call, um, but not. I know scrutiny chairs have already uh, met to, to discuss this in their work programmes, but um, Councillor Painter, if you'd like to respond to those three, please. Um, well, um, I'll go to Councillor Hawking on the children's, but if you'd like to respond to Councillor Mould and Councillor Edinburgh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Mould. Um, leisure centres are uh, clearly an issue, as the leader stated in his leader's announcements. Lots of work's been going on, and um, certainly South West Councils have done a lot of work on this and sent a letter um, through to, to central government um, asking for support for leisure trusts, because it seems to be the, the trusts that are the, the, real, the real issue here, where um, nearly 70% of leisure provision across the country is provided through leisure trusts and they've, apart from the furlough scheme, really have had no support. So the, the issue in Cornwall, and we're working very closely with GLL, our provider, um, they've had a, a number of things to deal with, um, not least obviously on reopening um, next Saturday, will be uh, this coming Saturday, we'll be looking at um, how they can do that safely within the social distancing and all the other requirements that they need to follow and government guidance. So some of our leisure centres really aren't conducive to that and it makes it makes it very difficult to operate with um, single point of entry to changing rooms and uh, things like that and, and single exits. So, um, you know, they've taken the decision that um, unfortunately at the moment only three swimming pools um, will reopen, but many other of the gyms will reopen and other parts of leisure centres will reopen, but there are five centres that will remain closed on Saturday, but we are working with them to try and ensure that those will open as soon as possible, because I know your centre at Weybridge and my centre at Launceston is one of those uh, five that will remain closed. So, um, you know, we will uh, continue to, to work with them for that to happen. We're continuing to work um, with the LGA, with central government, to try and make sure that we can have a sustainable way forward for leisure, because just when people need to keep their health 
um, uh, you know, high. They need to look after themselves, obviously, with this virus around, um, you know, not being uh, able to have leisure centres and access to that, as well as our children going back to school um, in September. We'll be looking to get back to swimming lessons and all the things that they use our public swimming baths for. So um, you mentioned a one million figure. Um, it, it's not a one million figure. Um, the figure that GLL have asked for is in excess of five million pounds. Um, and that still didn't guarantee that uh, every centre would have opened on, on Saturday. So, you know, we, we need to uh, continue to work with them. Obviously, we're working through the contract. You asked about a contractual change about losses. Um, clearly, the, um, the con contract is relatively complex as far as exactly how the the uh, the contracts work you know you will you will know that we made uh, a significant saving in letting this contract so that they could operate all the, um, leisure centers and we paid them extra money they used the capital money to invest in our centers to make them um, wash their own faces so that they could take the membership and the money from that and then we didn't pay them for operating them but they didn't pay us any dividend back again uh, they're just going to pay for the um, the amount of money that we uh, lent them up front to do the changes the capital changes they will repay that money with interest um, so it very much is ongoing in a very live situation that the whole of the country is facing similar issues not just here in Cornwall but we will endeavour to make sure all leisure centres will reopen and um, you know we will uh, you know get back get back to that um, Councillor Elliott, I will let um, Councillor Hawkin give you a, a fuller answer on children's services, but certainly we would not be proposing anything in the budget which was not agreed and not um, uh, not uh, yeah, uh, workable within budgets as far as any of the, the savings. And the same goes for Councillor Ellenbrook, um, certainly with adult social care. Um, you know, our, our colleagues there have had to work extremely hard through the pandemic to make sure that um, you know services we can support the NHS make sure there was capacity in our hospitals and do all that we can to help them out so certainly within public health and adult social care in my preamble to this um, item I did say that those were the two areas that um, whilst we may see savings in some areas we're not looking to cut back on those budget areas uh, thank you thank you and uh, Councillor Hawkin to answer Councillor Elliott's question, please. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, I, I, I'd echo what Councillor Paint has just said, that we consider these to be manageable savings. There's a range of different things in place. Some of that would be around vacancy savings. Some of that is uh, in common to lots of people, mileage savings from changing way of working, and also contracts being issued and to deliver some savings through that. As Councillor Painter said, all the detail will be going through scrutinies. Uh, I think that was probably the end of Councillor Hawkins' response. Um, it, it was uh, a coherent response. It just seemed to um, break out more suddenly than I was expecting. Um, so I've got um, people that want to come back in that have already asked a question. Um, so before um, I bring them in, um, can I just uh, make sure that there's no other councillors that would like to come in that haven't yet asked a question? Um, so Councillor Kirkham, please. Hello, just very quickly, I may, I had to step out of the room for a minute, so I may have missed the response to Councillor Ellenbrook's question just about the um, the review of adult social care and whether that will be coming to scrutiny because I don't think it's coming to scrutiny next next Wednesday so would that be coming to scrutiny with the budget in the I think September or October meeting you did miss the response so we'll provide oh, I'm sorry answer, given the constraints on time thank you no um so we um haven't got anyone else to ask a question um, in which case I'll go back to um, three people that have uh, indicated for a second time and then draw um, the questions to a close. So, Councillor Harris, please. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come back. Um, and sorry, very quickly, I don't think Councillor Painter has answered my question at all about what's in paragraph 1.8 in it is talking about the council underwrite the risk of the council having to underwrite additional payments um, which could be up to 10 million pounds and i don't understand that and the councillor paint hasn't hasn't answered that and I, and I wonder if i can just very quickly turn to the question councillor desmond asked 
about scrutiny having training on this on on, on this new budgeting process um, because it seems to me that the chairs and vice chairs of scrutiny are none of, uh, with one small exception um, are not um, opposition if I can use the word members um, and it would be very useful I think very democratic if we had to train chairs and vice chairs of scrutiny about this new budget process if one member from the opposition on each scrutiny committee could also attend those same training sessions so that they are not at a material disadvantage when we come to looking at budgets in the autumn. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, sure, Councillor Harris, that all scrutiny members um, will be able to receive training collectively, um, as well as the chairs and vice chairs uh, in particular. Uh, Councillor Desmond, please. Thank you, Chair. And um, <laughs> Councillor Harris has basically um, removed uh, my question, but if I may, I'd like to go to another matter, and that concerns the transport and infrastructure forecast for 2021. I'm a little confused where the figures are provided on page 66 under 4.17. There's a forecast variance there of 14.825 million, an overspend. And then in the paragraph beneath the table 16, with the figure I've just quoted, it says transport and technology is forecasting an overspend of 11.734 million, somewhat less than the 14.825. Of this, Nearly, eight, nearly 9 million, 8.946, is the forecast reduction in parking income. So my questions are, which is the accurate figure for overspend? Is it the 14.8 or is it 11.7? And secondly, is the parking income going entirely to transport, etc.? Yeah, parking income uh, does um uh, go to, to highways that's part of the rules that we work within. Um, Councillor Taylor, please. Leader, thank you for letting me ask a second question. That's very kind of you. Um, I would like to go back to um, page 43 and uh, somewhere in around that area there was a mention that there's a monthly submission to MHCLG and I believe that Cornwall Council have done three. Would that information be available to the elected members, please? Could I request that we see a copy of those submissions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you, Councillor Taylor. Uh, Councillor Painter, I thought um, you did, a uh, did address uh, the risk of underwriting, um, but um, those three questions um, for you, please, to respond to. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, Councillor Harris, the uh, payments on item one point, uh, sorry, paragraph 1.8, I was just, sorry, flicking between uh, pages and screens. Let me come back up to that around the business grants. Now, then the, the idea around this was obviously the 5%, uh, which gave us just under 13.4 million that we were able to provide through um, uh, through the discretionary grant. Um, if we spent more than that, then we would have to underwrite the payments as the council because they had been capped by government and it's government money from the, the original money that we had in for the business rate grants. Um, so we were, we were not able to pay in addition to that. Um, we've said that uh, well, we just I, I could check with the section 151 officer where they've said that the any additional payments have been capped i believe that was to allow us to pay out to um two businesses uh, and we can get an update i believe uh, miss langley may have an update of exactly how much has been spent from the dis discretionary grants to make sure that we didn't spend uh, way uh, over and above because if we paid out to all the 3500 businesses waiting for a grant clearly we would have spent way in excess 
of the 13.5 million. So um, whether it would be better to go to Miss Langley shortly just to get an update on that um, leader uh, would be helpful. Um, Councillor Desmond, I think we'll need to come back to you on your um, question and look into that and give you a written response because to be honest I'm not I wasn't quite following you um, and I uh, we can check again Miss Langley wasn't quite following exactly what you meant. Uh, Councillor um, Taylor I believe we're ahead of the game that we have actually sent all the information you're asking for and I believe Councillor Desmond has been sent that so um, whether we can go to Miss Langley just to confirm a few of those points leader that would be helpful. Thank you Miss Langley please. Yes, um, so on the 13.5 million discretionary grants um, allocation, um, the issue, um, and that's that a separate allocation from the original to the next. Um, Tracy, I'm not sure you're, you're normally quite clear, so we can hear you, um, but you're sounding quite faint. That's because I haven't got my thing on my, my mouth. Thank you, Leader. Um, uh, with regards to the 13.5 million, which was, a, which was a sort of second tranche of business rates dis uh, a discretionary, so a separate scheme um, that came from the government, and it was outside of the original 280 odd million that we got in the first tranche of business rates. Um, both of those schemes were very specific in their guidance. Um, however, in all in the discretionary piece, in order to um, pay all of the all of the business types that were in that the um, the sort of the guidance for the second tranche, it would have meant that we would have paid over 13.5 million. And members were really clear that what they didn't want to do was to um, pay out some of those business grants to some people and not to others. So in effect, what what we um, what we agreed was that there was a pot of money that was left in the original business grants um, pot that hadn't been paid out. So there was an underspend on the original grant scheme. Um, and what we said was, uh, even though the government had not given us the ability to be able to do that in writing, that, um, that members wanted to take the risk of, of using the underspend to shore up those people, who, those businesses who weren't getting paid under the second discretionary scheme. But what I didn't want to do was, uh, because uh, clearly this is an unprecedented dented um, time was uh, to to not um, not cap the amount of money that we should spend um, in that second tranche. So um, I asked members to limit that to ten million pounds. Um, and there is more in the underspend, but if government does does not allow us to use that money, then that the 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 additional money outside of that discretionary grant would have to be paid by the council. Uh, so we've all we've done is limited the amount of money that that would cost us, so, and therefore managing that risk. So to be clear, <coughs> excuse me, um, there was the ability to overspend against the allocation from government, but following. Uh, the policy which was the government guidance on who should be paid, we've actually come in um, near to the figure of 13 and a half million. Yeah, so we haven't we haven't yet paid out all um, to the level of 13.5 million, but we are expecting to. We're just waiting for businesses to give us their details uh, in order to make those payments. So we haven't yet breached the 13.5 million, but what we have got is a is an agreement that we can breach it should we wish up to a level of 10 million. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Langley. Um, and so as we move back into um, cabinet committee, we've got um, the proposer and seconder, but councillor uh, Mitchell has indicated that he'd like to come in. Yes, thank you, Leader. <coughs> it, it, I, I didn't intend to comment at all, but um, just listening to some of the questions, I think um, if there was ever a time that everybody needed to come forward and work totally and utterly on behalf of Cornwall, uh, it's surely now rather than to sort of fall down political party lines. Um, we had great fanfare that £440 million had been uh, given to Cornwall to help support uh, various things across services that were needed. Um, and then uh, Councillor Taylor on two occasions in public meetings said 
we'd actually received 328 million. It might have been 326, I'm not sure which. Uh, we had about three weeks uh, of quite voracious comments from the Conservative group saying uh, we had completely misunderstood this situation. The money was there, it was something like 50 odd million pounds, it was there. Uh, government has said we have, uh, could spend it. We tried to point out that that is not what government was saying. And what I would hope and ask the uh, Conservative group here in Cornwall is to actually join Cornwall Council and this administration's call uh, and scream actually for us to get permission to spend that money by supporting businesses here in Cornwall. Um, it was asked which um, councillors had, had agreed this and, and uh, the deputy leader uh, said it was yourself, him and uh, Councillor Dwelly, but we were all asked and my view, and I'm quite happy to publicly state it, was that we spent every single penny supporting businesses here in Cornwall. And if the government then did the disgraceful act of saying, no, we want it back, you're going to have to give it to us. Uh, my view would be, let them try and do that. And if we end up in the High Court, we end up in the High Court. We, we have got the right thing on our side by spending not just another 10 million of this, but I think there's something like nearly 30 million there, which was given to, by the government. And it was a fantastic thing to help support businesses here in Cornwall then please join us and have a united voice asking the government to allow us to do that. that that's what I would say. And, and, you know, that's all really pulled together. There is so much. There are going to be so many businesses that go bankrupt. There are going to be so many families that struggle to put food on the table. Well, I, I think it's going to get much, much worse. And come the end of this year, we are going to be in horrific position and I know we're, we'll be even closer to uh, the Cornwall Council elections by then but I really do urge everybody come on let, let's get on with it and let's do the best for Cornwall. Thank you Councillor Mitchell. Um, so we've got a proposer and seconder. Um, Louise if we could take the vote please. No, thank you, Lisa. Um, I'll take the vote by, by roll call. Please confirm after I call your name whether you vote for, against or abstain from the recommendation. Councillor Jeff Brown. For. Councillor Tim Dwelly. For. Councillor Mike Ethorn Gibbons. For. Councillor Julian German. For. Councillor Edwina Hannaford. For. Councillor Sally Hawken. For. Councillor Andrew Mitchell. For. Councillor Rob Nolan. For. Councillor Adam Painter. For. And Councillor Rob Rochel. For. Um, thank you very much. I confirm all members have voted unanimously for the recommendations. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Uh, so the next item is agenda item number seven, the consultation on pre-submission of the Climate Emergency Development Plan document stage two. Um, Councillor Dwelly to introduce please and in terms of uh, meeting management I'll take a 10 minute break after this item. Councillor Dwelly please. Thank you Leader. Um, I'm delighted to present this to Cabinet and I want to quickly thank Jackie Stenson and Rob Lacey, the officers who've worked so hard on this document. Um, councillors will remember how long it took Cornwall to have a local plan delivered. This isn't the same thing, but it's a, an important document. And for us to have it at this point uh, in, in, in this uh, time frame, I think is very impressive and timely given COVID. So um, just to be clear what this uh, is asking for of Cabinet, uh, the report is requesting approval to publicly consult on the second stage of the document. So due, due to the, the urgency of the climate emergency agenda and type, time scales uh, and, and a desire to actively involve stakeholders, this stage of consultation is a hybrid. Uh, we will be engaging uh, on potential draft policy approaches while working on other matters, including the potential broad locations for renewables and opportunities or allocations for a nature recovery network. Um, there's three periods in this consultation process. Uh, the first scoping stage uh, did actually finish on the 26th of May, uh, but we did extend it, that because of COVID. 
Um, that point of consultation, we had a, a, a very good response, 330 people coming back in, which is actually more than you would expect for this sort of thing at this point. So that was uh, overwhelmingly supportive. I'll, I'll mention some of the things they said. Um, uh, uh, broadly, as I say, supportive of the policy, but the concerns expressed included uh, better protection for trees, canopies and hedges, uh, suggestions for climate change policy examples from other authorities, a, a, a benchmarking and good practice, uh, the impact climate change could have on vulnerable communities in the sea, support for this plan and the idea of allocating areas for renewable energy deployment, wind and solar, uh, popular, a need to make it easier to get permission for renewables, for example, roof mounted solar, uh, and promoting cycle routes and sustainable public transport. Also, co-housing and uh, the need to plan for water and food shortages. Um, can I please mention something that I think is very important? At the beginning of this document, as it currently stands, we have some text in there which is about how Cornwall Council wants to lead by example. So you will see in there some references to, for example, the investment programme uh, having a theme on low carbon investment. You will also see uh, the desire for Cornwall Council to have a pot of money, a capital pot, which will be dedicated to low carbon infrastructure. Uh, and there are other initiatives that I have been involved with, including, for example, encouraging the community infrastructure levy, the SIL, to be dedicated to low carbon infrastructure, whether that's a town council or a community group, so that we're giving nudges and we're looking at this seriously. And of course, as we will discuss in other meetings, we will be, uh, of course, looking at what we do with our own property, our own car parks and all the rest of it in terms of how we work. So the Cornwall Council will not be asking others to, to do this. We will be doing it ourselves and, and, and setting, I hope, an example. So if I could please come to the recommendations to read these out, given that this is an online meeting, um, they are as follows that the Climate Emergency Development Plan document pre-submission stage be approved for public consultation, and two, that authority be delegated to the Service Director for Planning and Sustainable Development in consultation with the Portfolio Holder for Culture, Economy and Planning and the Monitoring Officer to make ongoing necessary minor amendments to the document as required. So I recommend this to you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Dwelly. Councillor Hannaford, to second, please. Thank you, Leader. I'm very happy to second uh, the proposal. Um, I agree with Councillor Dwelly. We have faced one emergency, but the climate emergency may have a slower lead in time, but nonetheless, it is an emergency which we have to respond to with the same level of urgency and fortitude. As with COVID, I believe that climate change will affect all parts of our society, but will affect those least able to respond, uh, not just locally, but globally. As Councillor Dwelly says, Cornwall Council must lead by example, and investment in the Benton Teak wind turbine um, is just one such uh, leading by example, and it will be generating very shortly. Therefore, I strongly support the need to address one of the main emitting areas at the root cause of climate change namely the way we generate the energy we need. We have largely decarbonised electricity generation, but we will have to respond to a growing demand for electricity as we move away from fossil fuels and use of gas to heat our homes, another large carbon emitting area. The DPD will provide the policy context for increasing the generation, uh, generation of more renewable energy essential for us strive towards our goal of net carbon neutrality by 2030. But it's not just about renewables and carbon reduction. There are undoubted environmental benefits, but there are also social benefits by addressing fuel poverty by having better insulated homes. There are clear links be between human health and well-being and access to the environment through cycle routes, sustainable public transport and of course environmental benefits to protect trees and hedges. This is a good first response with plenty of other chances to further influence the DPD's development. I hope this work and the consultation evidence can be used to persuade government to move at pace to make changes to the NPPF 
to facilitate the green recovery we need. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much, Councillor Hannaford. Uh, anyone else from Cabinet like to raise their hand? Councillor Painter, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. I think um, just very briefly, I would just like to say that I think this is a, a great step forward. Our climate change uh, plan was uh, lauded by many and certainly the LGA are using it as best practice as far as uh, some of the work we've done. Clearly from declaring the emergency, um, we move swiftly to develop a, a, a decent plan, which I think gives uh, really good outcomes about what we can achieve. I think an awful lot of people are talking about climate change, but I think we're actually getting on and doing stuff. And whilst DPD may not be a particularly uh, sexy document that people would say, well, this is great, you know, it's not quite as good as the, the forest for Cornwall for really getting people infused. I think when the detail about what we're trying to do and how we want to retrofit homes and do, do lots of stuff that will make real difference to people's lives, I think um, it is really important. And then it sets you know, that, that the planning framework to really enable us to make those changes. So, you know, it, uh, it may not be uh, such a headline grabbing uh, thing, but I think it is extremely important for us moving forward and making those changes that are necessary. So very happy to support it. Thank you very much. And thank you to the officers for pulling it together. Thank you, Councillor Painter. No uh, further hands up from Cabinet. Just giving them a moment. In which case, uh, we'll go to Councillor Allenbrook, please. Councillor Allenbrook. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, very simple question, hopefully, which is, um, and it was something that was discussed in the economy overview and scrutiny when we when we saw this. Um, there doesn't seem to be much of a communication strategy within this document. Um, and I would like, um, if possible, for us to recognise that there are a huge amount of people in our community who do not use the internet for whatever reason, and a lot of it is down to poverty, they simply cannot afford to, to do it. And if we, if we only do online consultation, then I'm afraid we are predicating our answers on um, a particular cohort of, of people, and that, for me, is, is very wrong. This is such an important thing for Cornwall that we must make sure that we communicate it to and allow people to, to respond to it in as many ways as possible. So could I have some comfort, clarity, call it what you will, that there will be a really robust and wide ranging communication strategy for this document? Thank you. Absolutely. We always have uh, physical consultation as well as electronic, but I'll let Councillor Dwelly pick that up. Councillor Desmond next, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, with the agenda, with this particular item, I'd like to draw in as well the context of what I'm going to talk, uh, request some uh, uh, a response to in terms of my question. It concerns procurement. Procurement in the context of sustainability and, as uh, Councillor Dwelly said, thinking Cornish doing business and shopping in a more sustainable way, to be aware of how production miles affect our carbon footprint. Let's be proud and spread the word about our award-winning and accredited Cornish products and services. And the uh, procurement motion that I have had the pleasure of co-authoring with Councillor Kirkham, which was deferred at the last full council to Cabinet. Bearing in mind the important, urgent, emergency style comments about climate change and sustainability and our duty to our societal uh, responsibilities in those two agenda items seven and eight is it not right that our motion should not be left to a bureaucratic process that requires it to be considered in september that we should meet the promises we were given at full council that it would be considered within two to three weeks. Why is this matter not being put today to Cabinet? Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Desmond. Um, that question isn't relevant to this document. Um, you've referenced uh, the process and the full Council have taken forward um, and that's the way that we'll deal with this. Councillor Rich, please. Oh, 
Oh, I think that uh, you are mute, Councillor Rich. Sorry, sorry, leader. I pressed it twice. Sorry. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I welcome. I welcome this. Um, uh, what the, the the comments of um, Councillor Hannaford and broad leader DPD. Um, I think it's fantastic for Cornwall. However, I would like to make a, a question to to the cabinet member for port for, uh, the portfolio holder. Um, is she? She may, she may be aware that um, at the moment Amnesty International is working with Greenpeace um, around the world to look at some of the um, some, some human rights and environmental issues associated with some renewable technologies. One example is batteries. Now we're talking about retrofitting houses. I know that um, uh, some companies are involved in looking at putting batteries now into homes. So when you've got your renewable um, solar panels, etc. They can be charging these batteries now. Um, there are ethical batteries available. Um, there are issues at the moment in the Democratic Republic of Congo, really big environmental problems, batteries being dumped in the ground, child labour, things like that. Now, you know, it's great that Cornwall gets greener, but what we don't want is for Cornwall to get greener at the cost of the environmental and human cost somewhere else on the planet, because then we're not really doing what we want to do. So really, and I'm sure Councillor Hannaford would agree with me on that, and I know we can't do everything and get everything 100% right all the time, but I would just like um, to know if Councillor Hannaford could take on board my comments and bear that in mind going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Rich. Um, Councillor Dwelly um, proposing this one. Uh, Councillor Monk next with a question. So if I can just ask um, councillors to put their X in the box um, if we've not got any more um, after we've responded to these questions, we'll move back to Cabinet. Councillor Monk, please. Thank you. Uh, it was just to pick up on the actual document itself. I think it's got everything in there. Uh, it just seems a very, very thick and well padded out document. I'm just wondering from Councillor Dwelly when we can expect to see it slimmed down and actually have an action plan from it that gives a broad outline of what we're actually going to do. At the moment, I think we've got a really good wish list, but it needs quite a lot of work and condensing if we're going to see anything tangible out of it. So it, a progress update would be great. Uh, just to pick up on what Councillor Ellenbrook said as well about the, the consultation that we seem to be doing for th this document and, and other documents as well. I mean, this document, uh, Councillor Dwelly just said we've got 330 responses, which is good. Well, out of a population of 500,000, it, it's not good. And I worry about our reliance on digital consultation. I think there's a lot of people who probably do access the internet, but they would rather consult or, or, or respond to us in a different way. Uh, and I think if you sent out a postal consultation, you might get a completely different set of results than you do by sending out the, the digital sur uh, surveys. We're almost, if we're not careful, we're going to get a form of sort of digital imperialism where we just use digital to, to sort of justify the aims that we've, we've got in the background anyway. So I, I do worry about that. So, so yes, yeah, so my question is, when can we expect a progress update on the actual document itself? And can we look at a, a wider form of, of, of consultation rather than just a digital format? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Monk. I may bring in the monitoring officer in terms of um, uh, equalities, um, equalities impact assessment and how we ensure um, that our consultations reach people because obviously um, this is something um, that has been raised as a concern. Um, I'm confident that we do do that um, but it would be good to hear those responses. So um, Councillor Dwelly please. Thank you Leader. Um, so taking those questions in order, um, Councillor Ellenbrook Yes, uh, I want to confirm today that there is a comms plan that does include non-internet means, which I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. But I'd like to suggest that if you want to write to me and to the officers working on this and, and come up with some of the things you think should be happening, we can look at those uh, suggestions and see whether they're in the comms plan. So um, I, I, my main message here is please suggest what you think should be done um, and don't assume it's not going to be because we will want to do that. Uh, obviously, we're not having lots of public meetings at the moment, so there are some techniques which I, I know you'll understand we can't use. But yes, uh, we, we, we do absolutely want to do that. Uh, Councillor Desmond, um, I know you went on to a different territory, which I'm not here to answer on, but I do take your point that 
uh, using local businesses is something that we need to consider in terms of carbon. Um, it may be that what comes out in the wash on all that can, can have a, 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 bit, a, a small echo in this particular document, but at the moment I can't give you that uh, guarantee. Uh, what I will say is that there are very many extremely talented um, low carbon renewables businesses in Cornwall, a sector which we should be proud of, and we are going to do all we can to involve them generally. Um, right, moving on to um, who we got, so uh, Councillor Rich Lowick. Um, Yes, uh, take your point. I, I agree with you. I think some of that is uh, as much for Edwina Hannaford as for me, but I do agree that we need to um, um, have a, a full carbon analysis. We can't just look at the carbon assumptions. We do need to look at what really is the carbon implication of going down a certain route. Uh, and again, if you'd like to write to me and to the officers involved, we'd be very interested to hear what, what, what you're saying on that. Uh, we need to be very honest about the total carbon implications of everything we do. Um, in terms of, uh, oh, uh, uh, Councillor Monk, uh, always good to hear from you, Ollie. Um, and um, I, I take your point on, on this. Um, we are uh, delivering here a DPD. It's not the same thing as an action plan. And I think we should be clear that this is the planning document. I did refer earlier to um, uh, if you look at pages five and six of the draft, you will see in there the bones of an action plan by Cornwall Council in terms of what it will do. Uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more work on that. I'm working very closely with Councillor Hannaford on this, uh, and, and we are uh, together uh, coming up with lots of new ideas. I mentioned the um, SIL being only for low carbon, low carbon living and infrastructure is one classic example, I guess. Uh, again, um, if you have particular things, because I know you come from that sector, if you want to um, uh, make suggestions, we are all ears and I'm very happy to look at those and I'm sure Edwina will be as well. I hope that's answered those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dwelly. And in terms of uh, councillors, Councillor Rich's question around human rights, then of course we'll be um, very uh, cognizant of that. Of course, if we can um, bring lithium um, to the surface in Cornwall and process that, then we'll know that people involved in that business will be um, protected by UK human rights legislation and employment law. Um, so that would be fantastic if we can progress it, but um, absolutely take the general point on board. Um, so no one else has indicated to come in. I did, um, the monitoring officer, um, Mel, would you like to comment um, in terms of how we consult and making sure that we're um, being accessible to a wide range of people? Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you, Leader. So my name is Nanya Sullivan and I'm Cornwall Council's monitoring officer. Um, so just to give uh, the com committee some reassurance, as part of any decisions that the councils make, we must take a community impact assessment, which ensures we comply with our obligations around equality and diversity, and also the human rights that the leaders just referred to. Um, you'll see in the reports, members, at paragraph 5.2 and paragraph 5.3, that sets out how we have to approach consultation during this time. And you'll see there the emphasis on it is reaching as far as possible communities around this issue as we can. I'd also just like to confirm for the Cabinet today that you would have heard before um, as an organisation during my time here, we've done a lot of work around how we get consultation right and we've made sure that we have regard to the relevant principles that are set out in the case law and those, those principles are what enable us to ensure that we have effective consultation. So uh, Lida, I hope that um, response to the queries involved. I think the commitment is there in the report. I think we've got the processes and procedures in place within the organisation to enable an effective consultation to take place. Thank you very much, Monitoring Officer. So uh, we'll move back then to uh, Cabinet Committee. Um, we have the um, recommendations proposed and seconded. Um, Louise, can you uh, manage the vote, please? Thank you, Leader. Um, I'll take the vote by roll call. Please confirm after I call your name whether you vote for, against or abstain from the recommendation. Councillor Jeff Brown. For. Councillor Tim Dwelly. For. Councillor Mike Ethan Gibbons. For. Councillor Julian German. For. 
Councillor Edwina Hannaford. Four. Councillor Sally Hawken. Four. Councillor Andrew Mitchell. Four. Councillor Rob Nolan. Four. Councillor Adam Painter. Four. And Councillor Rob Rochel. Four. Thank you. I can confirm all members have voted unanimously for the recommendations. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. So, um, as I advised, we'll now take uh, a 10 minute comfort break uh, ahead of going into agenda item number eight. Thank you, everyone. Just to be clear, that's uh, back at 11.30. Thank you.
Hello, welcome back everyone. Can we confirm that we're ready to restart, Louise? Yes, Leader, we're ready to restart. Thank you. Um, so the next agenda item is agenda item uh, number eight, the um, place shaping framework and town regeneration. Councillor Dwelly to introduce, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce this item. Uh, in particular, I know that it's uh, something that many councillors have worked on uh, both at the previous High Street Vitality Inquiry and at the relevant scrutiny committee. So what I'm presenting to you today is something that uh, cross-party councillors have, have fed into. Uh, and I think that's a, a good way to work when we can and I'm sure this will be well received. Uh, so what I'd like to open with is to discuss something that's important here. Previously, um, we as a council were not particularly doing an awful lot of economic development work in town centres and high streets and one of the main reasons was that um, European funding wasn't available for those sorts of locations, particularly where retail was involved. But we do recognise and have recognised for some time now that we have lots of towns in Cornwall which have real challenges in terms of their high streets and in particular now after what's been going on with Covid, that is very, very obvious. We have a big challenge on our hands and we have lots of very wonderful market towns and we are turning our attention to them. But also our approach to this, I think, is going to be slightly different. It's very much asking the towns themselves and those involved in them, not just councillors, but town councils and bids and chambers and, and local organisations to come forward and define the kinds of things they want to see done in their town and, and to ask us to come and help you. Uh, that is our intention. Where we can, we want to help you with your ideas. So that's a, a new way of working, uh, it, not instead of the other ways we do things, but as well as. So um, revitalisation, as I say, of, 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 of town centres and high streets was already a priority, but it's an, an even bigger one now. In February, Cabinet agreed the establishment of a four million pound uh, town centre revitalisation fund uh, and I'm going to run through some of the key elements in there. But I do stress this is not um, going to be confused or shouldn't be confused with the government's very welcome investment in town boards with town deals and in future high street fund. Um, so in our revitalisation fund, um, there are four main themes. Uh, at parts of the four million, if you like. The first one, which I know is of great interest to members, um, is up to one million pounds to fund allocations of up to 150,000 pounds per town for those towns which create partnerships or teams, if you like, and, and have plans of what they think is deliverable in their areas. So that money, that 150, that or less, it could be 100, it could, whatever the amount that's suitable, that in itself will not change your towns, but it will enable you to do what some towns in Cornwall have already done, which is to work up your proposals into deliverable projects. So that's the intention there. It will not include the towns that receive money from Town Deal or Future High Street Fund. So there are four towns that can't access that. The second theme um, is to look at strategically targeted place support to towns which already have specific opportunities identified uh, and they're in this report and they are Bodmin, St Austell and Liscard and, uh, and those uh, I will come back in a moment to the cattle market in Liscard which is also being proposed today. Um, the third theme is in joint regeneration projects of up to a million where Cornwall Council itself can be involved using its land and assets. Uh, in other words, what can we do with our buildings and land to help the process? Um, that will add to the other funds already mentioned. And lastly, there's a pot of up to 700,000 uh, for place initiatives, effectively a pilot fund to test and learn initiatives where they come up. So what we're having here is, if you like, some flexibility to respond quickly to if a town or an area has a great idea, we're willing to look at that and see whether we can help it. I'd like to stress that uh, this, this emphasis on towns is not instead of other areas. Villages and rural areas do matter, 
We are not as well advanced uh, on that as we, I, I see the leader is smiling. Um, uh, we are not as advanced on that as we are on towns. Towns are urgent, town centres, and people who live in rural areas use towns and it matters. But I do stress that we are intending in place shaping to develop some new proposals. And I know that the um, uh, scrutiny committee is proposing to have an inquiry into what's called hinterlands or villages. And I will take a great deal of interest in that and do all I can to bring forward new extra proposals proposals on this. If I can briefly please turn to uh, the Liscard cattle market. Uh, this is a strategically important site for the town and officers are working closely with local stakeholders. Um, it's a further £240,000 of local growth fund investment uh, which has been secured to enable works on the site and um, working collaboratively with, with Liscard generally uh, we will be talking here about small-scale workshops for local creatives but also to deliver support and skills development to businesses locally, which I know will help them uh, prepare for either new job searches or self-employment if that's what they're looking to do. Um, the project is seeking European investments from the community-led local development programme, but it does also need support from us at the council, uh, and, and, and therefore we're, we're being asked today, and I hope you will back this, to approve an allocation of 326,000. Now, finally, can I just turn to the, the word place shaping? Um, I'm going to read out the recommendations briefly, but I want to alter the first one. I think we are not really quite ready yet to define and set in stone what we mean by place shaping. Uh, since I've been on cabinet, I've, I've been hearing from people across Cornwall, and I'm very keen that what we do is prioritise a toolkit a very easy to understand practical list of things that towns need to do to apply for some of the funds I mentioned. I'm hoping that will come forward by early autumn. So if, for those of you wanting to know that, that is the pledge. We will get on with that. We're working on it now and it will make it easy to understand. Um, in terms of wider place shaping, uh, I suggest we will come back to um, uh, broad themes, for example, how we do rural areas and hinterlands, and, and we will continue to develop what we mean by the word place shaping. But the key lesson here for all of us is that Cornwall Council is now committed to place shaping, and it's committed to working with your areas to help you deliver what you think should be done in your area if we can. Right, so to turn to recommendations, um, if I can please suggest that the recommendation one would now read as follows, that the town renewal policy and priorities assessment, which is attached to the place shaping framework, be approved as council policy. We will develop a toolkit based on the approved policy and place shaping framework for local stakeholders. And the reason, as I say, for that change is that the council needs to be very clear about the policy and principles which stakeholders need to be aware of in their development of proposals and priorities. The other recommendations are as set out and uh, for, for those listening who haven't got paper copies, they are as follows. Uh, and I'm sorry, they're quite long, but I will read them out. The, the following allocations from the Town Centre Revitalisation Revitalization Fund to be approved to establish the first phase of the Cornwall Town Revitalisation Programme. Firstly, up to £1 million to be allocated for town development allocations to support functioning town partnerships in the development of their town investment plans. Secondly, up to 0.425 million, that's 425,000, be allocated for strategically targeted place support to three towns in Cornwall. I've mentioned them already, it's Bodmin, St Austell and Liscard, where specific opportunities have been identified linked to wider Cornwall Council activity. Third, up to a million pounds to be allocated to support joint Cornwall Council and town regeneration projects and leverage funding from wider investment programmes. Fourthly, up to 700,000 to be allocated to support place initiatives and feasibility for reactive requests to support towns through wider place shaping support already in existence and for the development of pilot activity and, and what we're calling test and learn initiatives in towns. Uh, fifth, in addition to the £100,000 agreed uh, in the February Cabinet decision, a further £255,000 is agreed to, to support the establishment of a High Street Vitality team across the Economic Growth and Development Directorate to support towns in their regeneration efforts. 
The third recommendation, please bear with me, is that decisions to award funding within the approved programme be delegated to the Strategic Director for Economic Growth and Development in consultation with the portfolio holder for culture, economy and planning and endorsed by the Growth and Development Board. Fourth, recommendation four, that Cornwall Council enters into a collaboration agreement with Liscard Town Council to deliver the cattle market makers project and that up to £326,000 from the Council's community-led local development programme match fund approved by Cabinet in June 2019 be allocated to deliver the project subject to securing CLLD investment. Five, the, the decision to grant a lease of the area comprising the cattle uh, market makers project as broadly shown in the plan and appendix two of this report um, uh, to Liscard Town Council for a peppercorn value be delegated to the Strategic Director for Economic Growth and Development in consultation with the Section 151 of Monitoring Offices and me as portfolio holder for Culture, Economy and Planning. Last one, number six, the holistic, uh, oh no it's not, there's two more, sorry. It's number six, the holistic programme approach identified for Liscard Cattle Market in Section 7 be endorsed. And thank you for bearing with me. Recommendation seven that the capital programme is uplifted by a total of 708,000 to include an additional award of 240,000 from the local growth fund for enabling works to deliver the Liscard Cattle Market Digital and Creative Workspace project and 468,000 to reflect delivery of the Cattle Market Makers project. That's the recommendations I would like to propose them. Thank you and I'm sorry they took so long to read. Thank you very much, Councillor Fraser, and for going through all of the recommendations. Um, but it's important uh, that people can hear them. Um, Councillor Hannaford, would you like to second, please? Yes, thank you, Leader. I'd be delighted um, to second the proposal. So, Councillor Dwelly has outlined uh, the investment packages, but um, I wanted to focus on the topic that he raised about place shaping in the context of localism. Um, so I'm sure quite, Councillor Dwelly will remember uh, Sir Michael Lyons back in 2007. He coined the phrase place shaping in his report, A Shared Ambition for the Future of Local Government. Um, and I do see his words referenced in the report. He said that in order to strengthen the connections between the individual and government and contribute to our wider national objectives, we must rebalance the relationship between the centre and locality and with our communities. I do have a slightly um, clearer view in my mind what place shaping is and what it can achieve um, for communities, but I do welcome uh, the toolkit uh, approach. So I see place shaping as a way to promote um, general well-being of a community and its citizens, to empower those communities, to revitalise our town centres and rural areas. But rather than a top-down um, vision of place shaping, this is definitely bottom up um, in innovative ways in local areas. We need to engage with our communities through devolution and rather than doing it to them, that's really important. In other words, localism. So Cornwall Council's role to me is helping communities develop their plans. The report sets out how we, how we can enable this through funding and support, bringing together a number of funding packages, working collaboratively with communities across Cornwall and with some targeted support and specific project in, in Lisgard. Place shaping should be, as the report says, for one and all and not a one size fits all um, and that will be um, the measure of success. Thank you, Leader. You're on mute, Leader. <laughs> thank you. That'll teach me to press the mute button, won't it? Um, thank you. Uh, so I've got three um, members of Cabinet um, who'd like to come in, Councillor Hawkin, Rochel and Brown, uh, then I'll go to the wider membership. Councillor Hawkin, please. Thank you. I'll be brief, but I can speak firsthand to the valuing of partnership that Councillor Dwelly and Councillor Hannaford just outlined. This has been very much, the scarred elements in here have been very much an example of Cornwall Council and local communities and town councils working together. The scarred items mentioned reflect that approach 
through elements of the cattle market site redevelopment that are led by Cornwall Council and ones that are led by the Town Council. I particularly welcome recommendation six, referencing the holistic programme approach, which recognises the need to work in phases, but with a coherent vision, one created through hundreds of responses locally through a charrette and form of public engagement. Looking forward to the next phases of the consultation, which have had to be delayed because of uh, current pandemic, but will now be September. So heartily recommend this to Cabinet. Thank you very much, Councillor Hawking. Councillor Rochelle, please. I think um, your screen is frozen, uh, Councillor Rochelle. We uh, can't hear you at the moment. Wait a moment, see if we can hear you now. If I go, oh, Councillor Rochelle, we're on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sorry, um, collapsing internet. Um, so my question is, is for Councillor Drellin. It's about recommendation 2E when we talked about the High Street Vitality Team. But it also refers to the point that Tim made around future uh, rather than just the, the, the major towns. I'm, I'm particularly concerned about the smaller towns and the, and the villages, because one of the, one of the issues that that's regularly crops up is that when uh, funds become available to high streets or towns or whatever, um, the challenge for the smaller towns and the local communities is the wherewithal to, to put that together. So they, they don't have enough uh, personnel or the finances um, to pull together a, a coherent bid against that, that funding. And, and, and I've seen examples over time where um, had they had that support and wherewithal, they may have uh, been able to make successful bids. So in terms of that vitality team, what's the longevity of that team? And will that team be available um, at the next round, as it were, where we offer that support um, to the smaller towns and the local communities? Thank you, Councillor Rochelle. And Councillor Brown, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, I'm delighted to support any attempts to assist our towns as they seek to regenerate. Uh, I do note that of the four towns who bid to central government for support through the High Street Fund, only Penzance was successful. Um, whilst I wish Penzance well in that, uh, I'm conscious of the struggle which other high streets are experiencing, particularly in trying to recover from the unforeseen economic impact of the coronavirus. Not least my own town of Newquay, who have this week been advised that we're to lose our only remaining bank in the town centre from October, which is going to cause significant distress and difficulty for some of our more vulnerable residents. I welcome anything which the council can and is doing to work with local councils to assist our high streets in recovering during what is the most challenging economic recovery in my lifetime. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Dwelly. If you'd like to respond in particular to um, Councillor Rochel's question. Thank you very much, Leader. And uh, Rob, uh, Councillor Rochel, yes, from my perspective, the, the Vitality team is a long-term commitment. Uh, obviously, we'll see what happens in the next council, but um, there's no point doing this just for a short period of time. This is a long-term change to what's happening in our towns, and um, I am very keen to make sure it's a growing commitment, not, not a one-off temporary one. Um, I'd like to, uh, I know people will want to know what do we mean by towns, and I want to say that we're not quite there on defining this. Personally, I, I am not hung up on the idea of only the largest towns being helped. Um, there are, in the local plan, 16 major towns identified, and given that four of those we've already excluded from some of these funds because they've had government funding, that leaves 11. Uh, but on on top of that, there are 14 uh, settlements with over 3,000 people living there. And I see no reason why they can't be eligible for either some of this money or for future funds if we, if we get, uh, make sure they are available. What I don't think we should do at this point is think the only game in town is this decision today, and that's the end of it. As I say, we will be doing place shaping work on uh, villages and, and rural areas. 
And it may be that what those places need is slightly different to towns with large high streets, but the commitment is there uh, to do that. So um, I, I, I think my, my simple answer is that uh, large villages and small towns should consider themselves uh, as, as the as putting, they should consider putting forward proposals to us um, and, and, and not assume they're excluded because that by doing that, they will inform our thinking about what they need. And I did mention the scrutiny committee has an inquiry which uh, is looking at so-called hinterlands and that's another route through which, um, shall we say, large villages can have their voice heard and, and it, we're all ears, as I say. Um, uh, Jeff Brown, uh, Councillor Brown, um, on, on, on this matter of, of town deals, thank you for being so kind about Penzance. We were obviously delighted, but my commitment uh, as a strategic cabinet member is to all towns in Cornwall. And one thing I'd like to emphasize here is that by working up uh, plans and teams and having a, a defined idea of a deliverable plan, I believe other towns in Cornwall will become more eligible for any future round of town deals. So if government was to come back and say there's another round of money uh, along these lines, and we know government is, uh, in, a, in a way I welcome, focusing on town centres, which I think is very helpful to us, um, then your best way to be ready for that as a town is to be involved in this uh, project we've just been talking about. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Rally. So at the moment, I've got four uh, councillors that have indicated to speak. Um, there's your opportunity, councillors, to put an X in the box if you wish to come in. Councillor Kenny, first, please. Oh, thank you, Leader. Uh, yeah, a very good document. I'm going to be entirely parochial. I find it very, very disappointing that my own town of Newquay has such small mention in it. There's a bit about the Newquay bid, which is going to have to pay the money back. And I think in an appendix, um, there's a list of towns in which you gracefully um, include Newquay. Newquay is one of the towns that has been most affected by COVID. We have a Sister, uh, we have a project that we've been working on for years. We have a business case all ready to go, which is the train station uh, regeneration. It doesn't get a mention. So where do we go for that? I mean, why why is Newquay not included specifically as one? Everybody else is, but not Newquay. And I don't think you can claim that Newquay is not a major town. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. Uh, Councillor Jenkins, please. So I'm uh, not going to be parochial, I'm going to be strategic, I hope. Um, I welcome the, the document and also the commitment to place shaping, future place shaping in villages and rural areas, which I think is something that we've long forgotten about. I do um, ask a question, though, about with the town, the smaller towns, place shaping activity obviously smaller towns depend very much on the rural areas around um, who use the facilities within the town so can we ensure that within the town's consultation and vision that there is a opportunity for the rural areas around to be able to um, speak up for what they how they view the town as well as the inhabitants of the town and also with the um, Cornwall Council help to facilitate and support the local place shaping and the vitality team, I completely agree that we need to have a long term um, aim to have that support in place so that the smaller towns and villages can um, uh, actually get the support they need to be able to um, contribute fully to the whole place shaping agenda. Thank you very much, Councillor Jenkins. Um, uh, if no one indicates after Councillor Craker, I'll take these as a forum. Councillor Kenny, if you'd like to turn off your camera, please. Councillor Desmond next. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, yes, I welcome this uh, document and these recommendations. Uh, I have a role as a board member of the Campbell uh, Town Funds deal. And um, not only am I grateful for the paper that's been put forward to cabinet today, but I think we really ought to recognise the huge thanks we should give to government for the enactment that they provided in November 2019 of launching the Towns Fund programme and their recent huge additional sums, particularly in 
my area of £750,000. So grateful to central government, grateful to you guys putting together the mechanism for delivery. And within that, I'd just like to uh, emphasise, uh, if I may again, the need for us to recognise the need to support local businesses, local employment, and the importance of ensuring that those are centred on our towns. And to be fair, I do find it a bit odd that Newquay is not included. Um, I agree with Councillor Kenny that there's something seriously wrong where that is excluded, and I think you need to revisit that and perhaps talk to uh, government as well. But if you take a look at uh, page 160, uh, paragraph 2.3, the point is well made that uh, we're coming out of a COVID-19 crisis, but it could well come back again. And so it's important the council, as it says here, uses its strategic ambition, planning policy resources and influence to identify opportunities to deliver local priorities and to take into account sustainable, vibrant communities. And going hand in hand with that, I think it's important to um, requote something that Councillor Dwelly said, who is promoting this paper, where on the uh, 15th of July, he said, together, let's work together to create a healthy, wealthy Cornwall by keeping things local and buying uh, and local and buying Cornish. It's in that concept that I return to my point earlier made about the need for us to ensure that our procurement policies which Cabinet has at the moment responsibility for ensuring it delivers, based upon the notion that Councillor Kirkham and I have put together, would enhance that undertaking in that agenda item. So my plea again to you, Leader, and to all of the Cabinet, is that they take this motion that Councillor Kirkham and I put together with all the seriousness it deserves and make it a priority to deliver that motion so that in hand, goes to delivering the aspirations of Agenda Item 8. And I call upon Councillor Dwelly in particular to carry this baton for us. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Councillor Desmond. And again, yes, of course, we will. Um, so, uh, Councillor Dwelly, if you'd like to respond to those three, please. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kenny, first, um, I congratulate you on robustly pushing the case for new key i can assure you there's absolutely no intention on my part or officers of excluding anywhere and certainly not new key i i think the way forward uh, i would like to suggest is that you you go for uh, one of these pots the the, the 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 first of the um items mentioned and that's the way forward to to, to bring further help from cornwall council um, uh, of course, Newquay is a major town. Um, this isn't a list of towns, and I would like to explain that. You will notice on the first item on this budget, deliberately, at my request, there are no towns mentioned. And that's because it's open to all towns, apart from those who are already funded through town deal, etc. And who knows, Joanna, maybe Newquay can become one of those towns in a future town deal. But to get there, Go for this money, I suggest, and we'll take it from there. The door is open, as always. And I'm very sorry to hear about the bank. That, that is really bad news. And I'm afraid we're going to see a lot more of this kind of thing across Cornwall. Um, Councillor Jenkin, um, yes, um, completely agree. I, I think I've already said my piece on this, on rural areas. Uh, people who live in rural areas in Cornwall use our towns. They have a say. And they are also important customers of businesses in the towns and it matters what they think and we will be listening to that. Um, I guess we probably aren't quite there yet on working out what pots of money and help go where because there is a focus rightly on high streets going on at the moment because they are under huge threat but equally um, this, this fund and future funds within this part of the uh, council's operation it's not the only thing that can be done to help rural areas. Obviously, you'll know this. I don't need to say it, but there's all sorts of policies on transport and other things that matter as well. But uh, please engage. Lovely. I think you will be. You may even be on the committee. I'm not sure the inquiry, but that's a very important uh, process. And I will be listening and helping that as best I can. Um, Councillor Desmond, 
Um, I've already said openly and very uh, happily that I strongly welcome the government putting money into town deals and future high street fund. It is welcomed. No one's being partisan about this from my point of view. It's great stuff. Uh, but we've also just heard from New Kid that was very upset it didn't get some. So let's see if we can do more. Uh, let's see if Share Prosperity Fund uh, is, is actually going to happen, anything like at the scale at which we hope it will, which would be the same amount of money as Cornwall got through the European programmes. Now, I, I suggest that if you can, you, you advocate that to Conservative MPs to, to lobby for that because we've asked for up to £100 million per annum. And with that kind of resource, we can do an awful lot more in other towns. Um, can I also say, I really agree with you, uh, Philip, about the focus on businesses. I feel very strongly about that, but you'll forgive me if I re return you to the point we made earlier. C Cabinet colleagues made it very clear that we have the money we need sitting in the bank from government to help Cornish businesses, £27 million worth for 3,500 businesses desperately wanting the amounts of grant they've asked for. The best way you and your, your colleagues in the Conservative group can help is to get behind that and join with the MPs who are agreeing with this and the Minister in Whitehall who agrees with this and lobby the Chancellor. The money's in the bank, it should be going to Cornish businesses, not back to Whitehall. And please can we hear no more from some of your colleagues who think it's useful to have a go at us about this. The money's there, let us spend it on Cornish businesses. It should be good news for everybody, including government, if that happens, and certainly good news for um, our businesses. Uh, lastly, on the Buy Cornish, uh, it won't surprise you to hear that I, I am broadly sympathetic to a greater spend on local businesses. Um, but that's not my remit, it's not my portfolio, but, but it, uh, yes, I am making the case for that. Uh, and I know that we have a lot of micro businesses in Cornwall and uh, co cabinet colleagues have heard me speak on this and you'll be pleased to hear that generally Cornwall Council is looking hard at this whole issue. And I, I'm sure if we get this right for the long term, something will be done, I think it will, but we're not there yet in, in terms of the detail. So let's see how that plays out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dwelly. So uh, our next three um, councillors to ask questions are Councillor Craker first, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I, I just wanted to highlight the project that's named in Liscard, and I do welcome uh, the investment in Liscard. And I think, um, as someone has said previously, this model is very good where it's essentially a project which has been worked up by the town council and has received um, will hopefully receive this support from Cornwall Council today and uh, facilitating other money coming forward and I think that's a good model um, across Cornwall and um, so I just want to put that on record to start with but the, the thing that concerns me is um, we talk about re you know regenerating our towns which is very important and, and working with our and parish councils which again is very important but sometimes it, it feels to me that we um as, as an authority are we, we don't always listen we will we, we, there are some things that we aren't doing very well so a prime example in this guard very recently we, we put in a request on behalf of our residents who overwhelmingly are calling for some um free parking in the town which is not unusual um, and the town council wrote a letter to the portfolio holder, but unfortunately that was rejected. So sometimes it, it does feel like Cornwall Council's giving with one hand but taking away with the other. And I just think it's important that when we're looking at um, these towns in this holistic approach, we, we do need to consider everything. And it, it's no good just to say, well, we've given you something, you know, that, that's the end of it, go away. Um, the, the, I think the revitalization of our towns is something which is not just going to be solved by one project, one magic bullet, and it's done. So I just hope that um, future requests and future projects, future um, requests for assistance are, are also looked on favourably. And this is not just uh, an end of the road for, for, um, for our re re revitalisation of our town centres. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Craker. Councillor Allenbrook, next please. Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. I was um, a member of the uh, Town Vitality Inquiries, I think everybody knows, and I've always been very passionate about this as a project for the whole of Cornwall. This is not just about where I live, this is where all of us live and the services that we have. And one of the things I think that's 
not really taken account of within this place shaping or I haven't really seen much, much reference to it is the amount of work that is done by neighbourhood development plans and what I would say is that we need to make sure that neighbour neighbourhood development plans are working together and that if possible we are starting to see them become part of the whole place shaping um, agenda. We did our inquiry before we even knew about COVID and thank goodness we did because I think if we had not Cornwall Council would not be in the place that it is now with a plan that's kind of ready to go. Um, so I think we were we were very fortunate. And I have to say all five of us on that inquiry worked together irrespective. And in fact, our political persuasions never came anywhere near this. This is about a project for Cornwall. This is not a project for any political political party or any particular area. We all work together. That is absolutely vital. But as I say, please remember, there's an awful lot of work being done, particularly in some of the smaller communities with neighbourhood development plans. And we need to make sure that those link in with what's happening in the wider place shaping uh, world. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Amber. Councillor Elliot, please. Um, thank you, Leader. Uh, would uh, Councillor Doyley agree that the reason that Penzance has done so well in terms of getting High Streets Fund and so on uh, is because everybody concerned from town councillors, Cornwall councillors, MPs, everybody worked together to uh, create a unified front um, and that that's something that should be um, taken as a, uh, if you like, a lead by other towns within Cornwall. Thank you, Councillor Elliott, for your succinct question. Um, Councillor Dwelly, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, Councillor Craker, um, yes, I, I, I completely agree with you that we do need to listen uh, and we do need to work things up uh, with you in the towns, or in fact, you need to work things up and, and ask us to help. Uh, it's not about us coming a, a lot around and deciding to plonk things down in a town. This is a, a new approach and I hope you, you will like it. Uh, it's very much, as Edwina Hannaford said earlier, it is localism effectively. Uh, it, it's something we're committed to and, and I think you should all expect to see more of this kind of thing. Um, in terms of listening and helping, I mean, I personally would be very keen to engage with towns on all this and I have already had some absolutely fascinating meetings. Um, one of them was actually before I became a cabinet member to go to view to look at their plans. Uh, Tor Point has some fantastic ideas coming forward and I had a really good meeting with Helston uh, very recently. Um, on the parking thing, well, you know that's not my portfolio. Um, I personally don't think that just saying free parking will fix everything is the answer to high streets. There's an awful lot more than that going on. And if you haven't already noticed, and this is really important, um, I, I was one of the councillors who pushed heavily for the parking uh, batch system, which now allows people to buy for just £25 uh, batches which allow people in most towns in Cornwall to park for a whole 24 hours for as little as one pound. Now that's exceptional. You won't get parking costs like that if you go to big shops uh, and, and, and town centre car parks privately run. So let's not make out that all of this is bad. There's some very good stuff going on on parking and if you aren't already pushing it in your community please do because I know people who absolutely love it once they use it and it normally means they don't park in back streets. They actually spend the money and they use our car parks. Um, Councillor Ellenbrook, um, one of my favourite councillors, Councillor Ellenbrook, I work very closely with you on this um, and I agree with you. This was a cross-party shared endeavour uh, and it was one in which councillors who represent towns uh, came together and gave their views and, and I think that was very helpful. Your point about neighbourhood plans is well made but I would point out that where there are neighbourhood plans actively happening, they tend to be part of those town teams. The only issue is that once a neighbourhood plan is actually adopted, uh, there is not necessarily a representative of that uh, process uh, anymore. So uh, it's a timing issue really. Um, uh, but I, I do agree with you and, and I can say to you that neighbourhood plans are always being considered in these processes. Councillor Elliott, absolutely couldn't agree more. What you said was that the Penzance example was an example of the town coming together and uniting and unifying. 
Uh, my message to other towns is do that. Don't be like Penzance was many years ago, where it had a massive civil war and a punch up. Be a town that comes together and please don't expect Cornwall Council and, and our officers with limited time and resource to be there to um, take sides in a civil war in the town. You, you, you must, if you can, come to a united view. It will be much easier for us to help you if you do that. And it will be much harder for us to help you if you don't do that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dwelly. So last call for questions on this item. Councillor Pascoe, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I, I wasn't going to speak, but I just wanted to refer to something, um, uh, Councillor Dwelly, uh, re responding to Councillor Craker. The reason we asked for free parking, Councillor Dwelly and members, was not uh, just generalised free parking. It was to do with the opening the town safely and recovery of Liscard Town Centre. We had many residents who had contacted us who said they were afraid to touch the keypad to put their registration numbers in or indeed handle coins and especially whilst the toilets weren't open to be able to wash their hands and especially as Cornwall Council had not put any procedures in place to sanitise those machines in between each use as the shopkeepers have had to for their card machines. It wasn't a blanket ask for free parking. Um, we were very disappointed that this request was rejected. It is a struggling town. The few shops that remained bravely open and supported um, people buying their vegetables and meats and, and, and essential provisions um, coped very well through COVID, only to be repaid by the car parks being resumed with their charging and the enforcement officers coming in and absolutely targeting people in car park um, car parking bays who unfortunately had got held up in pharmacist queues and banks a little longer than they'd expected and if we really are to help these towns recover we really do need to listen to those businesses to those towns and to the people who use the towns but um i, I just also want to add it, it goes without saying that i am um very very pleased to welcome any investment in this guard with the cattle market project and to thank the officers who have put in so much work over many years to get this project as far as it is thank you thank you councillor pasco point about car parking you've already made previously and been responded to so i won't ask councillor dwelly to come on back on that councillor may please thank you leader and good morning cabinet um yeah i wasn't going to speak but i just felt um, a little bit of reassurance is needed although councillor dwelly has said he's given his assurance uh, but it was 1997 when Penryn um, was informed that they were going to have a THI, a Townscape Initiative Heritage monies, which was 1.2 million at the time. It was about six years before the actual scheme um, got underway and the take up was very slow. And since that scheme ended in 2007-8, I have continually banged the drum for extra monies for the town. We are an old town and we do need um, premises of being let go because of no money by residents. Um, and of course, although we're classed as a university town, we are not, we are not. Um, so I welcome these recommendations this morning. Um, but what I am asking Councillor Dwelly for, and, I, and I've got to say he's answered the questions really great this morning. Um, and the backup um, from various councillors and cabinet is, is fantastic. And although Councillor Kenny is saying about Newquay, um, not mentioned in the papers, Councillor Kenny, Newquay's been mentioned every night on the TV, which I feel pleased at because, yeah, you do need help. But we all need a little help, as the Beatles say, a little help from our friends. Um, and I'm, I hope this time Penryn will get some help. I'm being parochial as well. Um, Councillor Hannaford says about one and all, and I really do hope it is going to be about one and all, because although Penryn is a small town, it sits on the fence with the larger towns because the population just goes over the threshold. But my 
ask to Councillor Dwelly is, is that it will definitely be a level playing field. Um, and as long as I have that reassurance, because don't let's forget, there's going to be a lot of work that will need to be put in to these bids. And I have to take my hat off. Uh, some of the team have already contacted Penryn and I believe Falmouth and I think that is really a step in the right direction and does give us some hope but just reassurance again from Councillor Dwelly. Thank you. Thank you Councillor May for your question. Councillor Dwelly if you'd like to respond and then we'll move to the vote. Councillor Dwelly. Yes yeah, so I, I gather not to Councillor Pascoe but I hear what she's saying. Um, um, Councillor May thank you. Um, yes um, absolutely a level playing field and I think as I said earlier I made sure that no town was mentioned in the pot for the up to 150,000 very deliberately to make it a level playing field it will be a level playing field but please not let's not across Cornwall think that this fund we're talking about today will solve everything it is an early start um, so, so bear that in mind I would stress that it's up to 150,000 it may well be that we make this for each other towns but the one thing that isn't a level playing field is this. If you are a town that is arguing amongst yourselves and disagreeing, it isn't our job to come in and fix that for you. Please do what to a point what Helston and other towns are doing. Unite, because if you come to us with a united vision, you are way ahead. OK, so my main message is do all those things you want to do. But if you're having a battle, resolve it. Because by doing that, like Penzance did many years ago, we stopped having a war, we came forward with a, a united plan and that led to investment. So from that point of view, I hope that's clear. And I'm, I'm sorry the town heritage took so long, Mary, all those years ago. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so Louise, if uh, we've had a proposer and seconder for the recommendations, um, Councillor Dwelly has read out with the uh, revision to recommendation one. Um, if we can take the vote, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I'll take the vote by roll call. Please confirm after I call your name whether your vote is for, against or abs abstain from the recommendation. Councillor Jeff Brown. For. Councillor Tim Dwelly. For. Councillor Mikey Thorne Gibbons. For. Councillor Julian German. For. Councillor Edwina Hannaford. For. Councillor Sally Hawken. For. Councillor Andrew Mitchell. For. Councillor Rob Nolan. For. Councillor Adam Painter. For. And Councillor Rob Rochell. For. Thank you, everyone. I confirm um, all members have voted unanimously for the recommendations. Thank you, Leader. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on then to agenda item number nine, which is the Extra Care Housing Strategic Partner Procurement. Councillor Rochell to lead, please. Thank you, Leader. This report provides details of the outcome of the two year procurement process for a strategic partner to deliver extra care housing across Cornwall. The procurement process ensures that we have secured the best possible option for Cornwall in developing much needed extra care housing. Members will remember the initial decision in November 2017 when we agreed as part of the wider transformation of adult services, this initiative. And I'm now pleased to recommend the award of the contract to Mears UK Limited to meet a substantial amount of the overall need for extra care housing in Cornwall. Mears are a very experienced provider of domiciliary care, supported housing and extra care. The delivery of extra care housing forms part of the overall transformation of adult services and will be critical in helping to provide the older residents of Cornwall with a viable alternative to moving into a care home. We have limited extra care in Cornwall and we know that our population is ageing and not only will the extra care units allow people to remain close to their communities when requiring care, it will also allow much needed family housing stock to flow back into the wider housing market. The strategic partner will be responsible for submitting business cases for approval by the council for the funding, design, build, housing management and provision of care for extra care housing schemes throughout Cornwall. The partnership agreement is for 30 years with a development period of seven years plus a long stop provision of a further three years and a requirement to bring forward business cases for 750 affordable units with a mixture of rented and shared ownership options. 
The care contract is for an initial period of up to 14 years. As part of the partnership, the council will be taking 100% of the nominations of all the rental units within the scheme and with nomination rights to shared ownership units should we wish. The council has agreed to provide sites for the development from its portfolio of land holdings and lease these to the partner for a nominal amount in order to assist in the overall viability of the schemes so they can be delivered at affordable rent levels. I've spoken to many of you over the last three years regarding this work and we will continue to discuss how the subsequent business cases submitted to us by MIRS will work for our local communities. I'd like to formally thank Sue Wright, part of Adult Social Care's commissioning team. Without her expertise and resilience, we would not have a strategic partner to work with. Unfortunately, the Health Scrutiny Committee meeting we had planned to present this paper to was cancelled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The next available meeting would be next Wednesday, the 27th of July, and subsequently this paper would not be able to be submitted to Cabinet until September. This vital project has taken over two years to bring to fruition and further delays need to be avoided. In principle, extra care has been discussed at scrutiny on a number of occasions as part of the transformation of adult social care and at an all member briefing session. I will now read the recommendations. Recommendation set out on page 202, recommendation one, that the appointment of Mayors Limited as a strategic partner for the delivery and operation of care housing, ECH, should be approved. Two, that the total maximum cost associated with supporting the delivery of the ECH programme of 2.13 million over seven years, with 0.188 million for 2020-21, being funded from the adult social care revenue budget and the future costs of 1.942 million be included as part of the 2021 to 25 medium term financial planning process be approved. Three, that authority be delegated to the Council's Adult Social Care Service Director in consultation with the portfolio holder for adults, the Section 151 officer and the Section 123 officer to approve business cases for extra care schemes that are brought forward and funded by the strategic partner during the 30 year term of the strategic partnership where the following circumstances apply. A. No additional capital funding from the council is required and B. The value of the council site does not exceed £1 million and C. Where a business case for an extra care scheme is developed and it is proposed that the development is funded by the council that any such schemes are not within the scope of this delegated authority and will be brought back to cabinet for any decision on investment. And finally, four, that the sites identified in the report are confirmed as the first tranche of sites to be developed for extra care, subject to the approval of these business cases in accordance with recommendation three, these would be disposed of on a freehold or leasehold basis for an appropriate sub. And I'd like to come back, if I may, uh, Leader, just before we go to questions from the wider membership. OK, thank you, Councillor Rochelle. Councillor Mitchell, second, please. Thank you, Leader. So in seconding this uh, really exciting and much needed proposal, I'd just like to uh, add that um, I believe this meets a significant need for suitable housing for older people here in Cornwall. Uh, the units that we're going to be delivering through this partnership will all be affordable uh, and I think that's something that we uh, can uh, all appreciate and be proud of. This could help older people to move into the specialist uh, type of accommodation designed for them and release a family sized house back into the housing stock. Priority will be given to eligible residents local to the scheme and only if vacancies still then remain, will they be open to eligible residents across the whole of Cornwall. All older persons over 55 who are resident in Cornwall will be eligible, even if they have no care needs. However, 24 hour care is available on site as and when they need it. So that is my only um, concern uh, in the proposal. Um, the adult social care do still use the word older in front of 55. Um, there was a time when I thought 55 was not only old but ancient, but seeing as that's only uh, eight months away in February for myself, uh, I am a little concerned that we're still putting that in and I think we need to drop the adjective older when 55 is being used. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Mitchell. Uh, so, um, from Cabinet, I have uh, Councillor Brown, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Speaking as somebody is, who is ancient, um, there are undoubtedly huge benefits for the health of our residents to be able to remain independent for as long as possible in their later years. And clearly, extra care is one way of achieving that. I've got no doubt that this scheme will be a great asset, uh, particularly to the people of Newquay, where we're looking to develop Tregunnel. Uh, and I'm happy to support it with two caveats. First of all, the loss of additional seasonal parking um, in Newquay is reprovided elsewhere, uh, potentially through a park and ride on the outskirts of the town. This would have the added value of helping to reduce congestion during, during the tourist season within the town and have a positive impact on air quality. And secondly, with my transport hat on, I note that the planned extra care facility at Trigonal will remove a key asset from the parking portfolio and there will need to be an appropriate adjustment to parking income expectations in future budgets going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, so I've got nine um, councillors from the wider membership that have indicated so far. So um, if there's anyone else who'd like to indicate, that will give us a, an idea of timescale. Councillor Rochelle, if you'd like to come back on um, anything uh, that Councillor Brown said, and uh, also further comments. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, each of the uh, proposed sites uh, containing the document, we've had discussions with uh, with the local members uh, who are involved in the project, and certainly in the new key new key proposal, um, the whole issue of parking and the revenue linked to parking has has already been discussed. And I know that we are working on a project with um, Phil Mason to to make sure that um, the parking issue in Newquay is addressed. And, and just two other wider points. Um, I had um, a series of questions or points for clarification yesterday from, from Councillor Harris and, and totaled some 25 uh, points for clarification and questions. And I've communicated with Councillor Harris and I understand that he's, he's happy to, to receive a, a written response to those and that will be ready within the next 24 hours. Um, also yesterday I received uh, a list of questions from, from Councillor Kirkham, some seven questions in total. And this morning a uh, question from Councillor Desmond and that his questions were virtually identical to the questions being asked by Councillor Kirkham. Those questions would have to be answered in part two. They are all directly uh, linked to the, to the pink papers. So um, one of two options I, I, I understand is one that we can go into part two and answer those questions, or uh, I'm quite happy to uh, provide uh, councillors Kirkham and Desmond with a written response uh, addressing their concerns. And again, that that uh, that uh, response would be available within 24 hours. And if they choose then to share that uh, with the wider membership, on the understanding there is a, obviously confidential, um, I'm quite happy with that. Thank you, Councillor Rochel. So we'll work through the list of speakers if um, uh, or questioners. Um, if uh, councillors can bear in mind that there is uh, a confidential appendix to the report. So if they do want to ask questions on that, if they uh, can indicate that is the case rather than um, asking the questions in public session um, but we'll work through the part one questions um, first and see how we get on with that so councillor taylor first please thank you leader um, i welcome uh, this proposal um, we have to recognize that here in cornwall you know our population is living longer and there are more challenging issues with living longer and there are lots of benefits as well apart from just being able to look after the uh, the elderly who are going to be over 55 which obviously brought a smile to my face um i i do believe it will be it will be really uh, good for being able to discharge patients from hospital and make it an easier transformation 
for a lot of people and also the benefits has, has been raised by Councillor Mitchell about releasing um, much needed family housing back into the market. Rob Watchell and myself have had obviously um, quite a few conversations so he knows I'm very very supportive um, but I do really want to raise at this point that this is uh, probably one of the most important decisions that we as a council are going to be making and it's going to be down to the cabinet to make this decision today and I am disappointed um, that there has not been that consultation with the security um, with the overview and scrutiny and it would have been perhaps very easy um, to have called a meeting just to have engaged um, with those members of that that uh, particular committee i do have a question in relation to the recommendations um, and it is in relation to the five risks that have been mentioned and because our papers now when they're on screen do not indicate if they're pink or not um, my risk that I want to talk about may be on a pink paper and that is on page 217. Um, so if somebody perhaps you may guide me that yeah. that might be something I need to raise now in a closed session. I'm just scrolling to make sure uh, 217 is in part one. Oh right, lovely. Right, well my, my, my specific question is um, if the cabinet do approve um, the appointment of NIRS today. Um, one of the risks that does concern me is risk three and this is that um, Mears have requested that the council share in the abortive costs for any full business case should the council decide not to proceed with that scheme. Could I have confirmation that that is an eventuality? Thank you. Thank you Councillor Taylor. Councillor Kirkham next please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I've tried to distill my questions down to three that should be okay for part one. If they aren't, I'm sure you'll stop me. Um, number one, what's the evidence that breaking up the contract into smaller lots, so local builders and particularly local care providers could bid, would have been more expensive or not possible, considering core care and our, our great work that our Proud to Care scheme has done recently? Um, number two, the scheme offers affordable rent, I can't see any mention of social rent, why not? And number three is I'm very concerned about some of the reporting to do with public contracts run by the preferred bidder. Have all of those reports been fully considered by Cabinet? Thank you, Councillor Kirkham. And just um, for clarity, did you want to ask any questions in part two? Um, I might do depending on the answers to the questions in part one and whether they cover them or not. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kenny, please. Thank you. Um, if you thought I was parochial before, uh, one of the sites, obviously, Tregunnel, is in my is in my division. Um, totally support the scheme. I think it's absolutely fantastic. No problem at all. Uh, we probably need locally some more information. I know it's going to go through planning, and our neighbourhood plan says we'll look at this based on its um, its merits. And uh, Councillor Brown is absolutely right. We are worried about losing, uh, especially now. Um, a, a large number of parking places, which is going to have a direct effect on our businesses. Really, a question is how wide does the scheme go? And uh, we haven't got the original pre went quite, went wider than Tregunnel, so it'd be interesting to see what the original scheme is. And also a question of when, because I would think two thirds of our usage of that car park is in August, so it makes a lot of difference whether you close the car park before August next year or after next year. I mean, is it next year? And at what stage are you thinking? of closing the car park. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. Uh, Councillor Rochel, if you'd like to respond to those three, please. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, Councillor Taylor, yes, um, we've had a number of discussions uh, about that and, uh, and I'm grateful for your support to the project overall. I am um, to risk three on page 217. Um, if I could bring um, Sue Ryden, who's been the, the lead officer on developing this, that might be a, a, a more appropriate way of, of dealing with that. So um, if I can ask Sue Ryden to, to um, answer that question, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Welcome, Sue. Hi, thank you very much. And um, 
Thank you, Councillor Rochelle, for your complimentary statement at the beginning. Um, Councillor Taylor, can remind me, it was about abortive costs and, the, and, and linked to the business cases, was your question? Yeah, it, it was specifically if um, op, if the recommendations go through, I, I specifically want to have clarified risk three about um, that me have requested that the council share in the abortive costs for any full business case should the council decide not to proceed with that scheme. Uh, yes, the we, we have agreed that if we get all the way through the full business case process and that will be after there's been an outline discussion so we'll have indications then whether there's issues if it gets all the way to the full business case we have agreed that we will share um 50 percent of the costs with with mirrors not 100 percent 100 percent only kicks in if we fail three consecutive business cases and then that's a completely different scenario would hope we'd never get to but quite frankly i think i would very much hope that as we're working in partnership with mirrors we would not get to the point where we have many abortive business cases, if any. Thank you. Councillor Rochel, if you'd like to continue. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, Councillor Kirkham, um, so um, I'll ask um, Sue to come back in on the uh, affordable social rent uh, question. The, the question you asked about me as, as a partner, um, we were uh, not aware of issues ab about the organisation when you made your, you initially approached me with, with your question and then we touched base with Mears and we've got a response from them because it was a it was a question that was more appropriate addressed to Mears. Um, so we've got an answer uh, to that. Um, but again, that potentially would be straying into, into part two territory. And I have got a written response from Mears, which I'm very happy to to share with Councillor Kirkham, and if she chooses to share that uh, more widely with with members, uh, th that would be that would be fine. Um, and, and sorry, can I have cl clarification on question one? So we've got uh, I've got a question two affordable, question three about Mears, and question one again. So Councillor Rochel, question one was around uh, what evidence is there that it couldn't be broken up into smaller lots. But I think one of the points that is made clearly throughout is that actually um, our need for extra care facilities is going to be much greater um, than this contract. So this is about delivering some of our requirements and we'll need to deliver um, other parts of those requirements in different ways in any case. Yes, indeed. Um, at this stage, the amount of extra care units we need across Cornwall is 3,500. And two, just over two years ago, that's we went out to the market um, with, 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 with that uh, bid. Um, we had a wide response to our uh, appeal for, for support. Um, that percolated down to only three uh, three organisations that were interested. Uh, one dropped out quite quickly, which left us with two. And along the way, uh, through the negotiations, uh, another dropped out. So it was wide open to to any uh, developer or organisation in Cornwall to apply for, for um, to work with us in developing extra care. What this project means is that it doesn't exclude us working with other partners. It seemed at that time that there wasn't uh, a Cornwall-based organisation that operated at the scale that we wanted to work at and at the pace. Because anyone that's attended any of the um, scrutiny meetings or all member briefings is really mindful that this is a huge hole in the provision that we have in Cornwall. We, we have a, a real scarcity of, of, of extra care facilities in, in Cornwall and part of this process will make sure that we get people into the right place for the kind of support that they need and at the moment uh, we don't have it and again 3,500 is a huge amount uh, of places that we need to be providing and we just aren't so it doesn't preclude and in fact we are already having conversations with smaller um, Cornish development organisations to run parallel to to this project so it hasn't excluded any anybody from it but it was the scale and the pace that we needed to move to move at um, 
And if I if I could bring Sue Roy back in again to to discuss the issue about affordable as opposed as opposed to social housing. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you. To one of the key issues around delivering extra care housing is the viability because of the scale of the build and the size of the buildings and the enhanced facilities that extra care comes with. To make that self-funding through the rents process, it is usual in the model across the country that you start with an affordable rent level. If you want to drive down to a social rent level and deliver the quality of extra care housing that I believe is essential, that will require additional public subsidy. Can be done, can be delivered, but it will require the council to um, put extra subsidy into each scheme rather than be funded through the rent process. Thank you. And I've got uh, Councillor Kenny's uh, question, one which was about parking uh, and already touched on that and about the work that we're doing uh, to look at parking and about consultation. It's clear in the document that each each individual proposal will come back with a business case. So this isn't saying this is a green light for all of them to zoom ahead. What we're saying is that each of those uh, initial that initial five each of them will carry a business case, which will have to be consulted on, on every aspect of that business case. So it's the design, the scale, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there will be plenty of opportunities for local members to be involved in the discussion, right from the, the planning application, right through to the design and et cetera, et cetera. So there will be plenty of opportunity for members to be involved along the way. And, and again, ultimately each business case will have to be signed off at cabinet. And again, that will be a further opportunity for people to make their views clear. Thank you. I did ask about the timing. Thank you, Councillor Kenny. We'll timing. Make the next three um, speakers. So, Councillor Harris is next. Thank you, Leader. Um, just at the out, I need to say two things at the outset, really. Uh, the principle of this is a no brainer. And of course, we should support, we should, we should support the principle. Um, I think, Councillor Rochelle, you were just slightly ambitious with your comment. But I said I was happy. I was I was happy with getting the full set of responses tomorrow. My problem here is this is a 30-year contract with the first break at five years. Um, I've gone through it, and I'm not an adult social care person at all. I look at this as a, as a common sense person, if you like, or a fool. Take your pick. Um, but I came up with a whole bunch of questions. Um, some of which might well be rubbish, but some of which are quite reasonable. Um, and I would have just thought that these, I, I find it very silly that these haven't in, this hasn't in the end gone through scrutiny and scrutiny and been given a chance to ask questions and dig deeper. And maybe, maybe one or two of the questions I've asked, because um, as I say, I'm not an expert at this. Can I, having said, having said that, and so I would, I would still think it would make sense for it to go to scrutiny in one way, shape or form. Just a, a couple of specifics. Um, in recommendation 3A, um, it talks about um, where the following services apply. 3A, no additional capital funding from the council is required. Additional to what? Um, in recommendation 3C, interestingly, I don't think is a recommendation, it's just a separate statement. In recommendation 4, it talks about the subject to the approval of these business cases, these, i.e. the properties, will be disposed of on a freehold or leasehold basis for an appropriate sum. Um, what's an appropriate sum? And then just picking up just a couple of points from the one, from the numerous points, as Councillor Watchman said, that I raised. Um, in paragraph 613, it says, and I'll give you a second to turn to it so I quote accurately. Um, it, it, it said, some of these, some of these things may, may, may not be completely viable and therefore the councillor may, may, may choose to mitigate the impact of these costs and thereby improve the affordability of the scheme by making a grant. Um, so who will decide upon that grant and where will that be scrutinised? Um, 
there was a question that comes that comes out from Councillor Kirkham's question, but it's, it's actually the other way around. Um, Councillor Kirkham was asking about social events as opposed to as a, as opposed to affordable events, but some of the people in need of extra hair care, extra extra care housing are actually fully able to pay a fully open market rent. So I hope we're not going to be subsidising people who actually can afford to pay a full rate. And then fin just finally, I'd understood that some of these units could actually be sold, whereas we seem to be talking mostly about renting them. So there's a list of questions there. My primary one is still, I believe this, this thing should have gone through scrutiny. And if we could find a way of doing it now, it would be very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Desmond, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, my question is quite specific. Um, first of all, I welcome this proposal in principle, but this is tempered by some procurement due diligence concerns, which I've written about, and I'm very pleased to hear from Councillor Rochelle uh, they will be dealt with in writing. Thank you very much for that. My query now concerns the specific issue of the duty of care the Council has to ensure all those working through this proposed strategic partnership will have a safe and environmentally protected working regime. The Customer and Support Services Directorate of Cornwall Council is headed by our Section 151 officer and she is responsible for, for procurement and supply management. The stated duty of care is profiled in the Council's health and safety policy which says Cornwall Council is committed to ensuring the health safety and welfare of its staff, visitors, contractors, residents and any other users of its buildings, facilities or services. However, the council more generally has an ethical duty and as a matter of principle to ensure that any failure of an organisation to the safety and well-being of employees working in such organisations on our behalf is investigated and sanctions applied as appropriate. To deploy a Councillor Painter quote, we need to ensure this council does not have the blood on its hands of workers spilt when employed on the council's estate. So, does the proposed partnership contractor have a health and safety policy and procedures that has been assessed for compliance with these duty, these policy duties which um, are stated by Cornwall Council? And what are the mechanisms for ensuring matters such as loan working, and the riddle processes are in place and a contractual requirement. What review periods will apply and what sanctions will apply for any pain, any failings by the strategic partnership? Thank you, Councillor Desmond, for your question. Um, I guess that would apply to any contracts um, where we've got uh, building work happening. So um, we'll um, bringing relevant officers on that. Uh, Councillor Monk, please. Thank you, Leader. I'm broadly in support of uh, extra care provision. It's something that obviously moving forward that we're going to be need. However, I still don't really understand why we, why we haven't gone to scrutiny on this. Uh, I think one thing that does concern me is the ability of the council to deliver things on time and on budget. Uh, the past track record last four years does concern me. The, Area in Newquay obviously concerns me, as has been previously spoken to by uh, uh, Councillor Kenny. The, the location in Newquay takes up two thirds of our biggest car park, uh, which stands to get rid of a lot of cars' ability to come into Newquay. And I'm not won over by the park and ride suggestion at the moment as well. Newquay has been hit hard by COVID uh, and with the closure of the bank. And we've also not got any money, as previously dis discussed, to develop the train station. So it seems like Newquay just seems to get shortchanged and, and people just seem to do what they want in Newquay. And, and I don't, I, I don't, sometimes I don't understand what the cabinet seems to have against New, poor old Newquay from where I live. So I'm not convinced about the location of this. Uh, but just to go back for a question that Rob didn't get a chance to answer was, and something that Councillor Kenny mentioned, is could he give a timing roadmap on the where we are now and for the eventual delivery of the scheme? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Monk. Uh, Councillor Rochall, if you'd like to come in, in terms of um, duty of care, um, perhaps um, uh, it was directed to the 
Section 151 officer, um, so perhaps um, uh, she would like to comment, or the monitoring officer. Um, Councillor Rochelle. Uh, thank you. Um, in my opening uh, statement, I'd said that this, um, this project has been um, more than two years in the making. And part of that is, is, is because of the uh, intense level of uh, checks that we, we've gone through to make sure that whoever we, we ended up being uh, a partner with uh, met um, our, our standards and our requirements. So whether it be health and safety, employment procedures or whatever, then that would form part of the the overall uh, review that we carried out again over over a two year period. And there was an awful lot of, of backwards and forwards between ourselves and and Mia's in terms of us being really clear what our expectations were of, of them as, as a strategic partner. And um, perhaps specifically, you're right, leader, that um, that could be answered partly by um, Section 151 officer. Um, but I'm, I'm fairly clear that the, that, uh, the policies and procedures that we've seen uh, are consistent with the level of, of the standards that we would expect to apply. And I've, and I've replied uh, to, uh, uh, to Councillor Desmond, or I will be, in more detail or very specifically around that, because again, I've said there are uh, uh, about seven questions that he's asked, so there will be much more detail about that. But perhaps um, it might be appropriate right now to bring in the Section 151 officer, etc., to make, or the monitoring officer, to make sure, give that assurance. If you're happy that, you've, uh, that you're responding um, in what you've just said and uh, in your written response, I don't think uh, we need to draw that out any further. And um, okay. there are questions on the recommendations from Councillor Harris. So, um, if I, can I deal with the scrutiny issue first, because that's mm -hmm. come up sort of um, uh, on, on two separate occasions now. And again, I, I referred to that. Um, it was due to go to scrutiny. There's there's not uh, an issue around us not wanting it to go to scrutiny. It was due to go to scrutiny, but alongside many other meetings, unfortunately, it was, it was cancelled. Um, there is a, a, a time pressure on this. It's been more than two years in the preparation. Um, we needed extra care housing three years ago. Um, and we, we say we spent more than two years preparing this. If it, if it isn't agreed today, then it would, we might be able to get it onto the scrutiny agenda for next week, but it would not be able to come back to cabinet till September, which um, potentially um, risks um, the relationship with, with, with the provider. And again, I'd, I'd just like to remind everyone that you know, we, we are, I've been working with one provider. We, we didn't have a queue of people waiting to, to work with us here in Cornwall. So, um, so we could go to scrutiny. Yes, of course we could, but it would delay and potentially uh, risk, risk the project. Um, social rent, uh, again, um, I think that's partly been answered by uh, Sue Ride in her answer to um, Councillor Kirkham. And the grant, e appropriate sum, uh, was a question from Council Alice about the grant. And again, each, it, as uh, I've already said, each business case will come back. So if it would, was um, necessary for the council to make a grant, that would be included in that business case. So again, that would be open for uh, discussion either at cabinet um, or if the business case were able to be put to scrutiny, then e each individual uh, request would be available for debate and questioning. So I, I, I can't give an answer on one particular one because it was, we don't know until we get the business case for each of those individual um, projects. Um, and the Councillor Monk talked about scrutiny, which I've addressed, and Yuki Parking, um, yes, again, we've, we've, we've touched on that with Councillor Brown and Councillor Kenny. Um, we were mi mindful of it. It's, it's an issue and we're working on that. And timing, uh, well, it would be wrong of me uh, to give a date for starting, but virtually as soon as Cabinet give its approval, we'll be sitting down with, with the strategic partner to secure those dates. 
but of course you know we're not going to see anything within within a couple of months because we've got formal planning etc et to go through an acquisition of sites etc so as soon as um, each business case comes through there'll be a time frame attached to that and again that will be shared um, publicly thank you councillor Rochel and uh, strategic director Ms. Charlesworth May has indicated. Would you like to come in at this point? Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, so I think it's probably worth just making uh, two or three points to um, give members some uh, assurance of the process and how we've arrived at what we have arrived at and our overall intentions. This is one strand of a three strand strategy. Um, and there will be opportunities for, um, uh, uh, for other providers to deliver extra care within Cornwall um, through the other strands with which we would seek to secure extra care. It's also the case that it's our desire to um, encourage a mixed market, a mixed market of provision, a mixed market of providers and a mixed market of pipes of tenure. Um, and certainly since we have been out to tender with this, um, uh, this contract, we have started to see other uh, providers come forward and um, seek opportunities to build one or two um, extra care offerings, not extra care offerings at scale, but those uh, by bringing through one or two smaller schemes in places that gives us the opportunity to have small schemes in small places. It also creates the opportunity for us to have schemes for sale uh, and it offers, a, offers us the opportunity to have schemes where we might have uh, mixed types of rented accommodation. So we are conscious of all of those elements, but we weren't seeking to address all of those elements through this strand. Um, the uh, last thing I was going to say is that uh, through this process uh, was structured on the back of very significant engagement uh, with market providers and potential bidders. And the original offer out to the market was for three lots made up of a group of partners. So we were actively seeking um, lots to be delivered by multiple partners so that we could involve uh, small local providers um, and that those uh, lots were intended to be delivered um, across Cornwall at different times so we, we staggered the rate at which we brought schemes online. Um, we had a mixed response to that so we structured our, we structured our tender to meet those aims and ambitions of what providers were telling us. We had a very mixed response to that um, and uh, two of the three bids that we received uh, drew at, uh, withdrew during the process. Uh, so that did limit uh, the, um, the way in which we could uh, uh, negotiate this final tender and contract. During that process, we undertook two stock takes. Um, and those two stock takes, uh, we considered whether we should proceed with the uh, tender as it was, um, and what our assessment was of our ability to bring other bidders into the market if we were to go back out with a different procurement in a different style. Um, and on both of those occasions, we concluded that stopping the procurement process and restarting it with a different um, outline proposal would not fundamentally change the level of interest that we were garnering from the market. Um, and I do think that's really important uh, because uh, we, we recognise we have had to make trade-offs I don't think that would be any different if we went through any different process, but what would happen is we would in all likelihood delay uh, bringing extra care into Cornwall by at least another two years. Thank you, Ms. Charlesworth May. <coughs> so, um, Councillor Tal, I've got your um, 
name down. Uh, I've got, um, I think, another six um, names down. Um, but it's um, cabinet members um, for hands up and wider membership for uh, cross in the box. Thanks very much. Um, Councillor Painter, if you'd like to come in. Thank you, Leader. Um, just to say, I'm you know very much in favour of this proposal, and as has been said, you know this has taken a while, and it's um, uh, you know to get to this point has taken us uh, longer than perhaps we would have liked. This certainly doesn't preclude local op uh, operators delivering their own extra care housing. I know we just had a pre-app um, adjacent to my division in Launceston where they're looking at an extra care facility which would be uh, you know, locally provided by private operators and it's, um, it's a, a local business and a local landowner that's looking to do that. So you know, I do welcome that and it is something that we do need within Cornwall to help provision um, you know, for this type of housing. Um, could I just also uh, reiterate to members that Cabinet does not uh, write or um, say what scrutiny has to look at. So, you know, scrutiny's agenda is very much in the hands of scrutiny committee members to scrutinise whatever they want. So the Cabinet Work Programme is published, um, you know, is online, it's there for everyone to see, you know, up six months in advance. So really scrutiny can look at anything. And I think several times in this meeting, you know, we've been asked why can't scrutiny look at it? Well, Cabinet has no control over what scrutiny does. So if members want something to come to scrutiny, they've got plenty of time to be able to speak to scrutiny committee chairs, vice chairs, raise it through their members, Every group has, you know, members on scrutiny that can do that. So, you know, I would hope that would happen rather than coming to cabinet and saying, why isn't this going to scrutiny? Well, you know, it's not cabinet's decision on what does and doesn't go to scrutiny. Thank you, leader. Thank you. Uh, so I've got five actually on my list at the moment. Uh, so Councillor Allenbrook next, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, just following up from, from that, um, I think in normal times, I would have hoped and expected that this would have gone to scrutiny. And I'm really disappointed that it didn't, because I think I've got a, a whole raft of questions that I would have asked in scrutiny. I'm not going to ask them now because we haven't got time, but I have to express my extreme disappointment that this did not come to scrutiny first because it should have done. However, a couple of couple of odd little bits and pieces. I think members need to be mindful of extra care is not just for older people. It is for people with disabilities, learning disabilities, physical disabilities, etc. of all ages. And I think it's really important we understand that. Um, what I am concerned about, um, and I am going to be parochial here, is that there was some discussion 12 months ago now with Councillor Rochel, and I have to say thank you very much to him because he was very good and very scrupulous in coming and visiting all the areas that you were looking at. But I am extremely disappointed that the proposed site in Poole has, has not come forward on this list because we have... In Campbell and Poole, Illug and Redruth, we have about 10% of the Cornish population living here and we are in one of the areas of high deprivation. And this is exactly the sort of place where this sort of facility should have been should have been offered. I am aware we have coastline housings um, facility at Miners Court, but I think with the best will in the world, nobody could say that that is actually state of the art and really where we want to be in the future. Um, and that is not to criticise coastline because I think they do a fabulous job there, but it's very much 1980s um, facilities. It's not 2020 facilities. Um, and I do as well um, have a lot of concerns about large, only at this, this point in time, looking at large developments. So I'm, I'm very happy to hear that actually there is um, scope within um, what adult social care want to do uh, to actually put smaller schemes in place. And we do have a site in Redruth, which is currently owned by can't remember now these places it was originally an NHS site anyway which we did look at and unfortunately we were told um, it wasn't eligible for the scheme you're currently uh, running so my question would be how do we make sure that that site which is still sitting there empty could actually become a smaller scale um, um, adult social care type uh, accommodation extra care accommodation thank you 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Elliot, next, please. Uh, hopefully some uh, um, uh, short and snappy ones, Alina. Um, first of all, um, I have concern over the fact that we ended up with only one bidder for the, the lot. Certainly um, in the procurements I do, and I know there are lots more in the hundreds of thousands, but if I was putting the bid through and I ended up with just one, I would have been told that my tender outline was too restrictive and go back to the drawing board. So I have a concern that we ended up where we are. Um, will the houses, we're, we're aiming that people will move out of their standard accommodation they've been living in into the extra care, will their houses, which obviously will go back into the general pool, uh, then be taken off the allocations uh, DPD? So in other words, if we're going to build 750, surely that means within those areas we need 750 less houses. And again, if if there is was that little interest from the um, the market to bid into this, why have we then got private individual or private companies down in Cornwall now saying they're interested in uh, producing um, houses of uh, extra care type? Um, that to me again would indicate that the original tender was was too restrictive in its description. Obviously, we all support this sort of housing. But I think the process doesn't look good um, when, when you just read through the documents. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Um, Councillor Craker, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I, I appreciate the um, there's an awful lot of consultation and work that's gone into uh, getting to where we are. Um, but my question really is about um, the pace that that this project is, is, is sort of taken forward um, because I, I appreciate this is, uh, as far as I'm aware, they're all, all the sites are on, have been identified are already existing Cornwall Council owned land. I know that the, the site that's in Liscard um, has uh, existing facilities on that site, such as the library service, such as the, uh, the, the planning team are in there, the localism team are in there and various other um, council offices. So it's an important facility in the town. I appreciate that there are uh, plans to relocate those existing facilities to make space for um, this extra care um, project, which is very important. But I wouldn't want to see those services lost in, in this regard, simply to make um, the space for extra care before new facilities have been made available. So I just want to have that. I appreciate a business case is going to come forward, but I want that guarantee now that there isn't going to be any loss of ex existing facilities before new facilities are made available uh, across Cornwall Council's estate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Craker. Um, so, Councillor Rochelle, if you'd like to uh, respond to those, I think I'll bring in uh, Mr Mason to um, comment on the DPD, allocations DPD, um, but Councillor Rochelle. Thank you. Um, I was going to suggest that. Uh, thank you. Um, so, so, I'll start with, with um, uh, uh, Councillor Ellenbrook. Um, I, I remember uh, spending many hours um, having consultation discussions with, with local members and at that time we were clustering people together because there was a lack of clarity over sites kind of two years ago. So it was, you know, and I remember the, the conversation around uh, around pool. And since then what, what I've done is um, where the proposed location fits into an individual councillor's um, division, then we've had direct uh, discussions with that councillor. So although, you know, in terms of pool, for example, um, it, it would have wider impact on the community, the specific location we've had consultations and discussions quite extensively uh, with the specific electoral member, division member. So, so that's, that, that, that has taken place. And, and just to confirm that we, we did do an all member briefing on the principles of um, extra care housing uh, in last year. So, so there has been lots of inf information out there. Um, there's a question about balance around the scale of each individual uh, facility, because it would be entirely appropriate, for example, in um, an urban setting to have a very, very substantial building, you know, 60 to 80 beds. So, so that wouldn't fit in a small uh, rural location. So that's the first consideration about, about the scale. 
The second thing is about, about, about the viability. And, and throughout the process, what we've identified is, is from an economic perspective, the most viable yes. scale is around 80 beds. And again, that presents us with a challenge because a number of the sites we looked at in the first yes. instance, and we were given access to um, many uh, sites owned by Cornwall Council, they weren't big enough. Because we have to remember that it's not just about making sure that the site is big enough um, to, to build on. But we have to provide the, the right amount of parking and the right amount of outside space as well. And I've, I've seen illustrations where the building itself was really very, very good. But actually, the things that went alongside it in terms of accessing the outside, outside space, etc., weren't appropriate. So, so it's a real challenge. And a number of the sites that we uh, initially looked at, we discarded because although technically they were without, big enough to put the building on, we couldn't meet all the other requirements as well. So it's a real challenge. And again, I've seen other examples within Cornwall of extra care, and certainly the standard of accommodation that we're looking at would far exceed what currently exists. So that's uh, so to move on to, to uh, Councillor Elliott, um, I think there was uh, an optimism around when we went out to the market that we would be able to attract um, bigger players, you know, we needed 3,500 units, which is a, a massive uh, scale. Um, we were, I said, we we're optimistic that we would attract interest. Um, that interest didn't materialise, and when we probed deeper into that, it, it appears that there was a nervousness um, about uh, about coming into Cornwall because this was going to be the first uh, project of such scale in Cornwall. And I have regular conversations with my lead member colleagues across the southwest, and they they didn't have that kind of problem because there were already substantial amounts of extra care uh, facilities in their in, in their um, localities, and this was a first. So we suspect that other developers were waiting to see whether this this project would be successful or not. And I think the other point to, around local businesses, I think Helen Charlesworth made touched on that already, that this is not exclusive. We're not excluding anybody. Uh, we're already having uh, conversations with a smaller provider in one of the localities in Cornwall. So this, this is about the, the bulk, but there are plenty of opportunities for smaller um, uh, developers to get to get involved. And, and Councillor Craker's uh, point, um, again, about complicated sites, yes, uh, the, the sites aren't all ready to go. Uh, there are uh, facilities on a number of the sites which we'll have to consider um, where they can be re relocated. And the pace, again, I've touched on that already, each business case will come with a time frame attached to it. So what it, there's a degree of urgency about this because I said already we needed these facilities two to three years ago. Um, but each business case will have a time frame attached to it. And so we'll make that available to, to local division, division members. And uh, Councillor Allenbrook and Craker both referenced the uh, extensive consultation that's already been undertaken. Can you say a bit more about what's happened with um, briefing members and uh, the scrutiny committee? So, um, right from the beginning, when we started to talk about uh, developing extra care in, in Cornwall, um, we set up a, uh, a series of meetings across all of Cornwall. Uh, it wasn't just about the five sites that identified in this paper, across all Cornwall. And each of the members that were in that locality, not just that specific division, but in that locality, were, were involved. And we invited them to come in. So we shared our thinking with them and we asked them for their views and potential other sites that weren't necessarily owned by Cornwall Council. So there was an awful lot of conversation that took place and continues. We haven't stopped doing that, you know, as recently as last week, we're having more conversations with division members. And again, I've referred to all member, we've, we have done an all member briefing on the principles of adult social care. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. Every pave, every step along the way of changes to adult social care, we have been absolutely open with, and we've shared that with scrutiny. Um, we, we've discussed this time and the unique set of circumstances that we were with. I understand the frustration around that. Um, scrutiny has always been supportive to whatever proposals adult social care has put forward to them. We, we've had um, 
task and finish groups, etc. And, and we've enjoyed that uh, that challenge. And um, unfortunately, this time was different. And there's no other reason behind it rather than the set of circumstances that were created due to COVID-19. That was the final point. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mason, would you like to come in on the allocations DPD, please? Sorry, Leader, could you just repeat the question for me? Uh, I'll let Councillor Elliott do that. Councillor Elliott, if you'd like to repeat your question, thank you. Yes, it was whether the 750 units, um, as they will be freeing up um, people's former homes, uh, whether those 750 units will count against the allocations DPD, especially if we're building them in chunks in areas that may have already had allocated sites. Um, so essentially they will count as new homes against all of the new homes which we complete each year and therefore they will be taken from the total number that we have to provide within the local plan target. So um, whether they count against particular allocated sites or not depends um, where, exactly where they end up being built. But we count completions basically. So yes, they will um, count towards completions of homes against our local plan targets across Cornwall and, 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 in, the, and in the different places in which they are built. Thank you. Um, so in terms of those that have indicated, I've got Councillor Rushworth and Tao left. Councillor Rushworth, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, I, um, I'm upset that, it's, that this hasn't gone to scrutiny, or I believe it should go to scrutiny. Uh, I don't quite share the, um, the, the, the comments that uh, that me as would, would pull out. It's only eight weeks. Now. Most of the officers and most of their employees are going to be taking chunks of that off anyway to go on holiday. Um, and um, I've got some cons uh, concerns really in uh, relating to the funding and the way, the way that it's going to be done. That can only discuss in, in other sessions. Um, and I've got some questions I'd like to ask on that. And they're all relating really to paragraph 2.5 on page 222. Um, and I, th I believe that as members of, of the cabinet that, you, you know, you should listen to uh, other members' uh, uh, um, concerns about the funding. I fully support the, the objectives of what this has done and I, I, I'm really appreciative for all the work that Councillor Rochel has done on it. Uh, we do need a, uh, a new standard of, um, of care going into the future. I, you know, I, I am concerned about whether private people will be able to do it. And I just give you an example that in Weybridge, we've had a scheme identical to this virtually approved six years ago, and it went through a planning revision and it's not got anywhere near off the ground and has just recently now been put on the market. So. I believe as cabinet members, before you go any further, you should listen to other members' concerns about the funding aspect. The principal, get on with it. Thank you. Oh, always. Um, so, Councillor Rushworth, if you'd like us to go into part two, that's what you're saying. I just cannot ask my question in, in, this, in this part, but I'm, I, would, I would leave it until uh, a scrutiny meeting if, if you as a committee are, are prepared to accept that. Uh, no, we, we've got recommendations in front of us, Councillor Rushworth, so I'm asking you if you'd like us to go into part two so that you can ask those uh, questions that you said that you have. I would like to do so, yes, thank you, but it's your decision, I understand that. Of course, uh, we always listen to members though, uh, the wider councillors, um, as you know. Councillor Tao next, please. Thank you, Leader. Uh, my question also relates to the, the scrutiny process. I think that this is something that certainly needs to go to scrutiny um, as I'm really concerned that, you know, we are sending out the message now that we are going to allow ourselves to have our feet held over the fire when it comes to working with partners in the future if if we are not allowed to uh, to exercise good governance in the, in the name of uh, rush and hurry. We still have to 
go through the planning process, which we are obligated to do. So uh, I, I just don't understand why this can't go to scrutiny. OK, thank you. I think um, we've responded to this question on a number of times. Um, I'm not sure um, that others have been um, quite as blunt as saying um, that items that come to Cabinet don't need to go through scrutiny. Um, there's the post scrutiny uh, process as well. Um, so uh, members can make use of that if they so wish. Um, there's no um, doubt in my mind that good governance has been followed. We don't um, have to take through items through scrutiny um, for good governance to be followed. I'll bring in Councillor Rochel, but I'd also um, like to confirm Councillor Kirkham. Um, would you like us to be going into part two so you can ask uh, financial questions? Um, I had kind of distilled my questions down to those three. So I feel that my questions were answered, except maybe for the last one that you did mention about part two for. OK, thank you. So you would be happy for us to go into part two? I'd be happy for that, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Rochelle, anything further to add at this stage? Nothing new, uh, Leader. Um, we, we, we've, we've talked about scrutiny I, and I absolutely understand what, what, what people are saying um, and, I, and I'm quite supportive to their view. Um, in terms of part two, yes, clearly there are issues that it would be entirely inappropriate because there are, are sensitive financial issues in the pink paper, so that's, that's appropriate. Um, with for, for Councillor Kirkham, we, we we're virtually prepared the responses to um, the question that she submitted, and I, and I am absolutely crystal clear about the point that she wants to discuss. Um, but the risk I have to um, supply the response that we had from Mia's themselves on that. Oh. Um, it's not a question that. I can answer. Yeah. I can only transmit the answer that I've had from me because it's about it's about me as so I'm, I'm I'm happy to do that in writing and that's virtually ready to go rather than the need to bring it up in part two. But but entirely, you know, I'm, I'm happy either way. Thank you. Um, so um, Chief Executive, please. Uh, thank you very much, Leader, uh, for allowing me just to make some comments. Um, the development of extra care, as the Cabinet member has said, has been uh, long trailed as being a strategic priority for this authority. Um, and that uh, the approach to uh, bringing forward the capacity has been subject to informal briefings with members of the Adults and Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. And uh, the strategic director has also taken reports to the committee setting out the approach that we uh, uh, were, have been pursuing. Uh, as you've made clear, Leader, and the portfolio holder, we have a significant need for extra care and the selection of Mears as our strategic partner goes some way to helping to bring forward the needed capacity that is so important to make sure we have a good offer for our growing older population here in Cornwall. This development is overdue and we can see that other councils that are further ahead in terms of their adult social care journey have uh, selected and built extra care out um, several years ago. So we are bringing forward this development as a priority for our health and care partnership. The selection of a strategic partner also brings with it investment. The estimated build cost of the 750 units is £150 million, which Mears will be bringing to the table as part of um, their selection as our strategic partner. There will be many more opportunities for the wider involvement of the membership as the business cases for each of the specific sites are considered by the authority in line with the approach that is set out in the report. Commercial services have worked very closely across with adult social care throughout this process, ensuring that the council's contract procedure rules have been fully, fully followed which has given due consideration to the range of issues that have been on members' minds, whether that has been issues around 
uh, fit with our supply chain issues with health and safety uh, issues um, to do with the fact that we have only had a single partner as the strategic director has made clear that they have been subject to review points. Today is about committing to entering into that strategic partnership. It is not to the exclusion of bringing forward other sites, but it is necessary in order to put into effect the strategic priorities of this council in improving and uh, reshaping our adult social care offer to better meet the needs of our community. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Chief Executive. So, um, Democratic Services Officer or Monitoring Officer, I'm um, happy to move the recommendation that we go into part two, um, but I'll need the relevant Julian, I... words. No, thank you, Councillor Rusher, if we've had um, plenty of discussion, bring you in in part two. Um, so happy to uh, move that, but um, Louise or Mel, if you could uh, read out the relevant set of words so that we can go into confidential session, please. Thank you, Leader. I'm just getting the wording here. Won't be two moments. No problem. So this is for the exclusion of the press and public. Um, the committee is asked to consider a resolution that the press and public be excluded from the meeting for the business specified in the following items on the grounds there is likely to be disclosure to the public of exempt information for the following descriptions. Um, the first description is information relating to the financial or business affairs of any particular person, including the authority holding that information, and also information in respect of which a claim to legal professional privilege could be maintained in legal proceedings. Um, there's been um, compliance with the public interest test provisions in the Access to Information Act as amended in producing the this report. Um, do you have a seconder to go into um, private session, please? So, Kevin, hands up. Function Councillor Brown uh, has seconded. Okay. Um, so, I should um, just say um, that uh, in terms of watching the, the webcast, we'll come back into um, public session after we've had the, the confidential discussion. Um, so I think um, now um, it's for you to take the vote, Louise, please. I'll just do the roll call at the four. Um, please confirm if you are vote for, against or abstain. Councillor Jeff Brown. For. Councillor Tim Dwelly. For. Councillor Mikey Thorne Gibbons. For. Councillor Julian German. For. Councillor Edwina Hannaford. For. Councillor Sally Hawken. For. Councillor Andrew Mitchell. For. Councillor Rob Nolan. For. Councillor Adam Painter. For. And Councillor Rob Rochell. Yes, for. Thank you. That's uh, unanimously in favour to go into private session. Thank you. Um, so I'll wait to be advised. I think it's um, from the uh, meeting producer. Um, Emma Richards.
Councillor Rob Nolan. Four. Councillor Adam Painter. Four. And Councillor Rob Rochell. Four. So that's unanimous to go back into public. So we just need to make sure the live stream is turned back on. Thank you. Um, so the meeting producer will advise us when that is the case. Yes, underway. Just a minute. You. So I'll ask you if you want to make a final comment, Rob, before we go to the vote. I'll just repeat what I just said. Yeah. <laughs> bowl and spoon are making me hungry so I'm going to sign out now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if colleagues would like to mute, mute if they're uh, not speaking. Thank you. Thank you. We're live again now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, thank you colleagues for that useful um, discussion, questions and answer in part two. Councillor Rochelle, please. Yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, just to confirm that we've hopefully managed to answer the majority of the questions um, in part two um, and those that we weren't uh, able to, I'll confirm that we will be providing a, a written response to, to the, those questions within the next 48 hours. So um, formally then to go back to the recommendations on page 200, 202 and uh, propose that they are accepted. Thank you. And they were seconded by Councillor Mitchell. So, uh, Louise, if we can move to the vote, please. Thank you, Leader. I'll take the vote by roll call. Please confirm after I call your name whether you vote for, against or abstain from the recommendation. Councillor Jeff Brown. Four. Councillor Tim Dwelly. Four. Councillor Mikey Thorn Gibbons. Four. Councillor Julian German. Four. Councillor Edwina Hannaford. Four. Councillor Sally Hawken. Four. Councillor Andrew Mitchell. Four. Councillor Rob Nolan. Four. Councillor Adam Painter. Four. And finally, Councillor Rob Rochell. Definitely four. Leader, I can confirm all votes are unanimously for the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, colleagues. Uh, so you'll be as pleased as I am. Um, that there isn't any other business that the chairman considers to be of urgency. Um, so thank you all uh, for your attendance and your contributions. I'll declare the meeting closed. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leader. Cheers, Julian. Well done. Thank Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you.